Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream where we have a chat with our friend. And today we have, of course, here Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> I am feeling so much better. Oh my God. Still got a little bit of a cough, but I actually don't think it's COVID related. So I'll take it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's a that's so much better than last week, right? So much better than last week. Oh my god! I was looking back to uh, like you you posted some clips about like hot takes about Encanto and and other mm-hmm. things like that, and I was like, I sound so sick, <laughs> <laughs> and it's because I was. <laughs> yeah, um, but now we're coming back and we're talking about Harry Potter and that's everything right. groovy. Oh, oh, thank you so much, Kitty, and welcome in, by the way. Welcome Kitty. in. Thank you. We have to have, um, you know, nice, beautiful, soft uh, Hufflepuff lighting for t- today since we're talking about yeah. Goblet of Fire. So I'm trying to be like, you know, bright and warm <laughs> and, and soft. And uh, I'm trying I'm trying to radiate Hufflepuff energy. <laughs> we love Hufflepuff energy. <laughs> Yes, we got to have golden ears for today. We have golden ears. Yes, yeah, so exactly, exactly, Landon. We are talking about Goblet of Fire today. Team Puff. Kitty, you are actually a Hufflepuff. Is that right? You're not just pretending? I, I'm just pretending sometimes. I'm actually a Ravenclaw. I am very, very annoying and a know-it-all. <laughs> today is our day to Huffle, right? <laughs> today is our day to Huffle. Mm-hmm. I have to argue that you're not, you're not annoying. <laughs> Well, not anymore. I've learned. Uh, You didn't know me when I was, you know, actual Harry Potter school age, to be fair. True. Very true. Uh, Yes, but yes, we're talking about Goblet of Fire. This is the, unfortunately, the only book where Hufflepuffs matter in the narrative of the story. So we have to wrap the probably one stream where we're going to use the Hufflepuff background and everything. So enjoy, Puffs. Enjoy. (laughs) This is probably it. This is all the time we have for you. Uh, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's just how the books go. Okay, it's just how the books. Go. I love <laughs> puffs. They're the second best house. It's well, 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 well. Um, I mean, <laughs> I couldn't say that. Like, I couldn't be me and not say that. Like, I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I agree. They're the second best house. I just think that we're disagreeing on what the first best house is. Let's yeah. not talk about it. <laughs> Right. Let's talk about Goblet of Fire, actually. Goblet of Fire! <laughs> How do we uh, want to get started today, Landon? Absolutely. First, we want to, first and foremost, as we do with every single Harry Potter stream, we want to say that this episode of Interstage Window will contain spoilers about the Harry Potter series. It's been out for 20 years now, so sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and we go beyond spoilers. We go yeah. beyond spoilers, by the way, just to make sure that it's clear if this is your first Harry Potter stream that you're catching. This isn't just spoilers for the Goblet of Fire, which should be obvious. This is spoilers for the entire series and the extended universe and all of that. And, I, and, and Kitty, I think that was a very well-placed Mr. Smith laugh, um, you know, because we have to talk more, because since we're talking about disclaimers right now. So yeah, spoilers for the entire Wizarding World and all of it. <laughs> While we will hyper-focus on Goblet of Fire, we cannot and will not promise that that's all we're going to talk about because honestly, it's all got to do with each other. That's what we're yeah. doing here. Yep. Um, on, honestly, too, that there will also be discussions of topics involving dynamics of past and continual lo- abuse, as well as the discussion of the AIDS epidemic. That did not change. We're actually not discussing the AIDS epidemic, but there will be talk about slavery and anti LGBTQ rhetoric within the books. Yes, um, we are going to get into sexism. some, yeah, <laughs> we are going to get into some, um, some, yeah, some trans misogyny stuff today. We're going to get into slavery stuff. So even though we forgot to update the text here, um, still pretty serious <laughs> things that we're going to talk about. And as always, since Harry Potter is, is all about abuse, abuse is in every episode. So, it you know, literally is. All right. Yep. And last but not least, we would also like to make clear here at ESW that we do not agree with Joanne Rowling's abhorrent statements about the trans community. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, we encourage our viewers, instead of subscribing or instead of donating money to us, we ask that for these episodes, you go to a nonprofit to support trans youth. Uh, we recommend, as we do every uh, Harry Potter stream, the Trevor Project is doing great work to make sure that LGBTQ youth are off the streets and in safe places to be and with safe homes and safe people. Yep. Unfortunately, Twitch does not allow me to turn 
off monetization. And as you guys know, we're pretty small operation here, so I don't make much. But if you are inclined to donate today, uh, the Trevor Project is a better place than to me. Uh, I don't need it. I'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Let's start with everyone's fa favorite things, favorite things, Karen. <laughs> this book is huge and massive. I'm almost tempted to pull it out, but I won't. It is it is like 600 to some odd pages long. How did you choose your favorite thing amongst oh all my God. things to choose? And what is it? Oh my God. So this book, you are right. It is so massive. And oh, we uh, my favorite thing in this book, however, is uh, Ludo Bagman. And did you know that Ludo Bagman does not have any official art whatsoever? The only official art I could find of him were screenshots where he looks really crappy in the old <laughs> Harry Potter games. So instead, I pulled this from Harry Potter Confessions, where somebody had fan casted him as Martin Freeman. And I just want to read this, because um, I think this is really, this is really interesting for an older Ludo Bagman that's canon in the in the movies. Um, I get that Ludo Bagman was cut from Goblet of Fire movie due to time constraints, but I wanted to see him in it, and I really think he should have been played by Martin Freeman. That was, in my opinion, the number one worst missed casting opportunity in the whole series, plus the fact that Martin went on to play Arthur Dent, John Watson, and Bilbo Baggins. If he could have been in the Harry Potter movies, on top of all of that, it would have been such a nerdgasm. I mean, I wouldn't have been mad if you had been cast as that, so I'll give you guys... It. Yeah, that would have been good. Um, I'll give you guys some background about why I love Ludo Bagman so much. I, I love background characters. As you guys know, my favorite characters as a role player are characters where you get to know a little bit about them, enough to kind of feel like you know what their deal is, but there's, a, there's just so much not filled in. So you get to fill in all of that stuff yourself. So those are the best characters to role play, best characters to write fanfic about. I just love it. So when um, when Landon and I were in our Marauders role play together, one of the characters I played was Ludo Bagman. Um, I shipped Ludo Bagman with that role plays uh, Alistair Moody, played by Shadow, who is a dear friend, although I know she doesn't attend the streams, but uh, shout outs to, to Shadow. And, um, and this was built off of the... Um, animosity <laughs> that is canon between Alistair Moody and Ludo Bagman. Alistair Moody has some serious issues with Ludo Bagman. Ludo Bagman tries to pretend that he has no idea why Alistair Moody has such strange issues with him. And, um, and from that, a beautiful ship was born. And now when I go back and read this book, it's just like, it's so inspiring and makes me remember that role play and, um, and all of our wonderful fun times. And, uh, and I made Ludo somebody who was uh, very familiar with um, with betrayal. He had been betrayed by Barty. So we had like him and Barty had been friends in the past. Um, I made him where he was actually part of the order. And uh, that was why he had a relatively short Quidditch career. It wasn't as in canon where he moves on to working in the games department in the ministry. Like he has this very quick shot at fame and then he goes into the ministry and, and rises in the ranks there. Um, instead, I had him quitting because he was, he was so interested in the order and that and, and fighting there and that's what um, made him want to join the ministry so that he could be one of the ministry insiders as we know that's very important for the order of the phoenix the, the version that's in canon in the books and the past one from the marauders era that's important in both of them so um so that was my character ludo bagman and uh and he was great he was great and i've played him again au versions of him over and over and over i love him so much i love your ludo i love how how unafraid of being good and flawed you make him um he's deeply flawed within the book there's gambling debt uh alcoholism hinted at um and you you take that and you run with it so that he's a good guy it's not very often that we see good guys with things that we consider flaws that are inherently not good yeah, I try to think of him as kind of like, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm very particular with with my friends and who I really get close to. Um, I'll, I'll make friendly acquaintances with pretty much everybody, but uh, but it takes a lot to get to know me on a deeper level, Landon, you know this. And so I just Were think you? about kind of... <laughs> I just think about kind of the um, the people that I know that struggle with things like addictions in in life. And I mean most of them are not bad people they're trying to do good things but they just have poor coping skills for one reason or another and so that's how i try to think 
of Ludo? Is he somebody that just never developed proper coping skills? It's not that he doesn't have a good heart or good morals. It's just that he doesn't know what to do when his brain's on fire, you know, and no one ever helped him with that. <laughs> do we, does anyone really know the best way to do with your brain on fire? I mean, it, ta- it takes a lot of work to learn. I'll say that. <laughs> a lot, a lot of work. Mm-hmm. All so that's right. my favorite thing. So what was your favorite thing from this book, Landon? There is nothing, nothing as quintessential as awkward young adult dating. <laughs> and I feel like the Yule Ball shows all aspects of that, all aspects mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have, you know, the like the idea of these two boys who are relatively good looking. One of them is literally famous. Yeah, and, and they're at least like, average looking. Like nothing in the book looking. says that they're gorgeous, gorgeous, but they they're not ugly or anything. They're not no. Um, and they're the main character's protagonist, so you have to kind of assume that they're good looking. Right. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and just like awkwardly upset about not like asking people out. And then also like being like, okay, well, our other friend can go with us. And then being upset that that other friend already has plans and like (laughs) just the quintessential awkwardness. And like, don't get me wrong, especially in RP and writing and trope, I am in love with the idea of like a masquerade ball and a major ball. And, but usually those characters are old, a little bit older, even if they are teenagers. Um, So like, the fact that we get this vibe, but for our characters, it is a middle school dance is so funny to me. Is because we're like this beautiful ball and literally middle schoolers. <laughs> And can I say, I love how that is ramped up in the movies. I know this movie in particular is where the movies and the books start to diverge quite a bit. And I have, um, and our episodes aren't really about the movies, but I do from here on forward, I have some criticisms about changes that the movie started to make. But this is one of the things where they added in scenes where I think like, yes, I wish we would have had more of that in the books because I feel like the movie makers for this recognized how pivotal how pivotal the awkward dating and dance of the Yule Ball was and how it really should have had even more focus. And they just gave us all of that. These yeah. scenes are like the best. <laughs> this, is the one, this is the one thing in, in, um, in Harry Potter that changed from the books to the movies that I approve of. That it is like mm-hmm. how they made the Yule Ball look. And like the fact that it also in the movies devolved from this like really fancy, proper, you know, dance lessons, waltzing, foxtrot sort of thing to a concert. Um, <laughs> it just like great segue. And I love that. And it doesn't obviously happen in the books, but just, yeah, again, that awkward middle school dance. I mm-hmm. I love it because I also love like when I was a kid, when I was that age and I was reading this scene, I'm just like, oh my God, this is so romantic and so cool. Even though obviously nothing romantic was happening in this situation. <laughs> But now as an adult, I'm like, it's so awkward (laughs) and it's wonderful. I loved Mm -hmm. it. I love every moment of it. Yeah, it's really great. It really reminds me of like actual middle school dances that, um, that I participated in as the age of the characters, you know, and, 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 and the band and the band is like, you know, fun and crappy in the same way that a fun, crappy DJ would be at a middle school dance. Like, it's just, it's just perfect. It's just perfect. I think that for a lot of these books... JKR has a really bad idea of what it's like to be a kid, um, especially a teenage boy. Um, but as a as a as a child, she's not. That is why I don't think she'll ever write children's stories again. Is because she isn't good at that. She isn't good at being a child and and, and writing from that perspective. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It only gets better and seems more realistic as the editing process goes on, which we'll talk about. Um, so I think that this is the only time that this is done like genuinely, where yeah. it's like, oh, this is how 14 year old Harry and 14 year old <laughs> Hermione and Ron would act. They mm-hmm. would act like this. This feels mm-hmm. 14. Um, and everything else feels so much older, like they are aged up, but this particular scene is just like, oh, they're, they're 14 
And this, yeah, and, and like this, you you knew that kid. You knew that kid, right? That was like so <laughs> upset that he didn't get the exact date that he wanted, that he was going to be rude to his gorgeous date that he should have been having fun with. And like, and I'm just like, and an adult would never do that, right? An adult would be like, well, whatever. I've got a pretty girl anyways and fuck it. But like as a kid, like they would be pouty and, and sitting in the corner it's just like wonderful. Ron and Harry did. It's great. It's so, mm-hmm. Love the Yule Ball. The, we're not going to really dive into it. Um, this is most we'll talk about it, but it's awesome. Yeah, wanted to give it a mention because it's one of the best parts of the book. All right. Shall we talk about the importance of this particular book uh, and how it affected the media before we head into the summary? Yes, as we like to do, of course, we like to give a little background on kind of what was going on in the zeitgeist and for that particular property that we're talking about. And um, and so what was going on during the time that the fourth book came out? So... As the fourth book was coming out, the first movie had been greenlit for pre-production. So there is about an hour or an hour. Oh my God. There's about a year between the, the, um, when the book, the fourth book was produced and the first movie came out, Mm -hmm. but pre-production had already started. Casting rumors were already going around. There were auditions being held in England. Um, Obviously the the book deal had already been made or the movie deal had already been made. Um, And there was confirmation that it wasn't going to just be one movie Mm -hmm. that this was going to be the entire like so they weren't going to do the whole four books in one movie it was going to be one movie per book and this is really the first time ish we kind of get the sense with narnia but this is really the first time ish that there is a movie on par with that level that there is going Mm -hmm. to be a long-term seven possibly seven movies dedicated to Harry Potter and that really with the hype that was in the writing that really then hyped up younger generations because movies were coming out so that kids could read the books and then watch the movies and have a deeper understanding of things um so that was something that was awesome uh that really kind of blew things up yeah I remember I remember what it was like um being in the fandom at the time all movies were the movies were coming out there was all these casting things I remember (laughs) I remember being young and sitting on these forums and with a bunch with a mix of ages and uh, and thinking back it was probably very easy to tell who was the younger fans and who was the older fans because there was a good section of the fandom that just didn't understand why all of the actors had to be British and why that was so important to the production and why that was so important to JK Rowling and all this stuff and we'd be like <laughs> but why not this actor why not that actor you know I don't understand da, 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 da. so and so would be better blah blah whatever I mean you know how fandom arguments go and um and like people just did not grasp it but um other people were saying things like it was a stroke of genius and that was wonderful. It was great that, you know, she was going to kind of keep things in the UK since the UK was such a big part of the books. You know, another thing that I didn't fully understand as a child, how integral the fact that it took place in the UK and how much of a comment the series was on um, the weird issues in the UK school system and how it was critiquing them. You know, I didn't understand that. I was a freaking kid, right? But what was wonderful about the movie coming out is that all of a sudden, all of my normie friends were also part of the Harry Potter fandom, right? Like my nerd friends already were at this point because Harry, Harry Potter fandom, as I've shared before, was a fandom that crossed real life and internet for me, which was which was great and what kept me in it for so long, even after I started to think like maybe Harry Potter wasn't the greatest thing on earth, right? Um, but uh, but this, this was like, oh, a movie's coming out. My normie friends can get into it. And so basically everyone I knew that hadn't read Harry Potter yet all of a sudden wanted to read Harry Potter and catch up. And they did. And they did. It was, it just, it it exploded. It exploded like no other book release. Well, and this is like, I am a, I am a result of this explosion. This is when I got into it. Um, I very particularly. Yeah. Sounds like Kitty too. Yeah. So this was when I started reading. I I was in second grade that summer. I was transferring over from first grade to second grade. uh, The summer that the Goblet of Fire came out. Um, it was probably around September, so prior to the movie coming out, uh, that my second grade teacher recommended to my dad, because I was in second grade, reading to me every single night, this book series. Uh, and in between that year, my dad and I worked through the first, second, third, and fourth book. Uh, we finished the fourth book right around the time that the Sorcerer's Stone came out. Um, so within that year period, 
And it was that time that I realized, A, my love of reading, but that's also what started my writing is I started writing fan fiction, not knowing it was fan fiction, not having access to online forums or anything. Again, I was very young, um, but I started writing stories based off of Harry Potter at this point during this gap as it exploded internationally, worldwide, Obviously it had been, it had been on top of the best times, New York best time sellers list and continued to stay there. But this is like where it blew everything out of the water, where yeah. you looked at the first four things and it was Harry Potter, Harry Potter, <laughs> Harry Potter, Harry Potter. Um, yep. And if and you guys remember it, from our first episode, where we talked about this, the New York Times bestseller list, they completely redid how it worked because yeah. of Harry Potter. And it was right? because of this particular book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is this is the book that broke the New York Times bestseller list. Yep. And this was kind of like, and this also started kind of the era of um, midnight releases for books and for movies. So this was, um, this was the first book where I can remember people actually were going like the night before or like first thing at crack of dawn in the morning when the bookstore opened to get this particular book. Um, people were lining up to see this movie at a midnight showing the very first day that it was able to be released, the Sorcerer's Stone movie, right? I didn't quite participate yet in uh, in the midnight stuff. I was still a little bit young, but I would start participating later. And it was it was this this book and then the first movie that I can remember that really kicked that off. Um, I'm sure there are examples where that happened before, but not but to the degree that this did. And what they were is that they were smaller things. Mm -hmm. Like comics were very popular for midnight releases during that time. Yeah. Um, so smaller comic book stores would have midnight release parties. We're talking Barnes and Nobles. We're talking Borders. We're talking uh, Books a Million. All of the major chain bookstores started hosting their own get-togethers, um, started having hired staff that were just retail people, normal people, rather than people who like this niche thing. Yeah. Um, and they had enough money in order to do it. And then, yeah, again, there were always kind of midnight showings. Like that was just something that like late night showings in movie theaters. <clears throat> but it got to the point where enough movies were being sold out that they needed multiple theaters in order to show that movie at multiple different times. Yeah, like so it was a big like deal. 12, a 12, 15. Um, a, and that's what really solidified the concept of the midnight release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what it could be yeah that's um, great. so yeah that changed everything uh so let's get into what about this book made it so special yeah so as we like to do for those that it's been a while since you've read the book or if you never happened to catch harry potter and and you know haven't read it now we're going to just very quickly summarize the um, major plot points of the book so that you can follow along the various things we talk about because the different topics will completely jump around in the timeline of the book. So Landon, as always, has a beautiful summary written for us. Um, I will warn you ahead of time that I have not included your favorite part. And I'm not saying that to you, <laughs> I'm saying that to everybody because there is so much shit that happens in this book that the summary is already a page long and I had to go skim. <laughs> So I will not mention your favorite part. If you have a favorite part, maybe we'll mention it later uh, as, as a deep dive or bring it up and we can circle back to it in another episode at some point. Mm -hmm. So we start with the scene of a murder. As a muggle spies on Peter Pettigrew in a mysterious voice, we learn that things are changing in the wizarding world and Hogwarts is no longer the safe haven it was supposed to be. Flash to Harry Potter, home at the Dursleys once again, as he wakes up in the middle of the night, throbbing pain in his scar that Voldemort had given him, giving hint of a connection. Harry isn't at the Dursleys for long, as the Weasleys come and take him, him away, this time totally legally, uh, <laughs> while having a, as Arthur Weasley and, and uh, Vernon Dursley have a very stiff conversation in the living room. Uh, Harry is taken away because they are attending the Quidditch World Cup. And at the cup, we learn about Ron's crush on Victor Crumb, and we meet several important characters. Cedric Diggory, Barty Cr Crouch Sr., and Winky, a very good house elf. With Ireland winning the cup, the casual KKK members, I mean Death Eaters, torture muggles, and everything is jokes until dark, the dark mark appears, and everything slips into chaos. 
Upon the return to Hogwarts, the Golden Trio are impressed with their new DADA teacher, Mad-Eye Moody, who teaches them the unforgivable curses of Vada Kedavra, Imperio, and the Cruciatus Curse. It is also announced that the Triwizard Tournament, a very deadly school competition, will be taking place this year, and two additional schools will be joining the students at Hogwarts. And in a mysterious turn of events, Harry is chosen as the not-supposed-to-exist fourth contestant, where, you know, in the books, Dumbledore responds rationally and in the movie he loses his shit um <laughs> the triwizard <laughs> tournament is broken down into three tasks fighting a dragon to get its eggs where harry is is fighting the biggest and most dangerous creature a second the secret task of inviting members to the yule ball harry and ron think girls are weird and don't ask the people they actually want to ask and hermione dates an 18 year old mermaids then take the p- hostage the people that they care that the Champions care about most in the world, where Crumb is suddenly, that's Hermione for him? We don't talk about it. And the third most important task is a giant maze made that turns out to be a trap. Upon deciding to win together, Harry and Cedric are yeeted out of Hogwarts to face Peter Pettigrew, cutting off his own hand and resurrecting Voldemort back. They kill Cedric without a second thought. And Harry... Has, uh, Harry has to escape, briefly meeting his parents and, t- and returning to the school to announce that Voldemort is back. But that's not the end of it. It turns out that Mad-Eye Moody isn't actually Mad-Eye Moody. He's the secret son of Barty Crouch Sr., Barty Crouch Jr. The ministry remains in denial and the press, which has painted Harry as the golden child and has not- caused him nothing but problems, turns against him. And Harry leaves the school in a far worse place than he's ever been before. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) This book is so good, y'all. Just listening to that again, like, it made me tear up. And I just think about, like, that that scene where where he sees his parents, where Cedric dies, where he sees all the Death Eaters. Like, it just, like... I mean, it is scary. It still like gets my heart racing as as an adult going back and reading it. It's just as, so good. As an adult, but also as someone who has finished the series and knows the like almost reflective idea of Harry for the first time meeting Voldemort and meeting his parents in a spiritual form and for the last time meeting Voldemort and meeting his ha- parents in a spiritual form and having that like connection from the fourth mm-hmm. and the seventh as well. And that knowledge makes it hit different every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, again, yeah, this is the first time, I mean, Harry's killed someone actively at this point in the quarrel, uh, but we don't see that. And he never really acknowledges it at that point. It was a self-protection thing. This is the first time Harry sees someone die. Yeah, this is the first time that he is truly affected by everything. And this is the moment it's very obvious to this entire book. This is no longer a kid's book. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is a young adult novel. And we'll talk about that in a second. But it is very, very obvious that Harry. So not only is the writing no longer young adult or no longer child, but Harry is no longer a child uh, Mm -hmm. by the end of this book. Yeah. Yep. And um and obviously we're going to talk about how much the the writing has improved in Jesus this book. Jesus Christ. Is, <laughs> it's so good. And I have said from the beginning that I believe that um uh, some strengths that Rowling has as a writer really are in her the way she describes locations yes. as well as her action scenes like the quidditch scenes are some of the best ones in the early books and this book is just action scene after action scene after action scene in crazy location after crazy location and it just it's just so good like this in this book now i i love harry potter but the prose isn't the best like let's be real in most of it but this book I disagree. I actually think the prose itself, like the way that it's written, is immaculate in this book. It's so good. Um, I wish I could say that about uh, all of the Harry Potter books, but this one, it just, it plays exactly to Rowling's strengths, like exactly to her strengths. No, it really does. And and I think that a lot of that comes with how much teamwork is involved in making these books at this point. Yeah. Um, But also uh, comes with the fact that she's found her genre like she started writing as a kid's book but it's very obvious with how 
the book series was supposed to go in her mind when she wrote the first one, not knowing anything about what was going to come um, and how childlike she wrote it and how much she has been yearning under the surface to actually break out of that children's literature mold. This mm-hmm. is the first time it settles into place and she's allowed to write all the ways that she is writing about. She's mm-hmm. allowed to have those graphic uh, action scenes that are really boring for children's lit to read. Um, like, so children's, children can't read and can't have that access most of the time if you're looking at children's literature. Um, you're able to spend more time building up tension because that's what makes it interesting for young adult and adult readers. Yep. Um, and I just that- wish when I when I read this book, it like makes me lament because I mean, I, I lament that um, J.K. Rowling decided to, you know, show her whole ass um, with the way that she tweets now um, about her transphobia. But it, I also lament the fact that she it seems like she resents being a really good young adult author. And she goes off to write these adult mysteries now that are really crappy and nobody likes. And I wish she had just gone and been like, you know what? People like the young adult adventure. I'm going to write more about teenagers fighting monsters. If she had like written more, some other series about teenagers fighting monsters, I would have probably read it and loved it and and think today that she's a great author, you know, but unfortunately she goes on to write adult mysteries. And I think like, well, you know, she had one good story. Sucks. She isn't really a good good author. (laughs) There's this idea of shame attached to the fact that she is a, that she is a young adult author. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing to be shamed about. This yeah. is amazing. This is something yeah, that's good. really vitally important and obviously changed the world a lot more than I think adult fiction would have. Yeah, I think um, so too. So yeah, JK Rowling, you know, maybe you can redeem some of your, um, you know, get some of the, the public goodwill back if you go back to writing about teenagers fighting monsters. Like, no, let's do that. No, she'll only get the public goodwill back if she has, like, some sort of exorcism and realizes that she is a turf and she needs to change. I mean, she um, should at least delete her Twitter, <laughs> minimum. <laughs> I can delete her Twitter. Um, yeah, so that final genre shift really improves the writing. But mm-hmm. as I was also talking about the teamwork involved, in this story um Mm -hmm. there was a lot of editing that happened you can tell with how like the depth of characters and stuff like that in the third book as the genre changed and as it grew in popularity but this is where you can tell that there has been heavy editing and not in a bad way but in a way of we need to hear more internal thoughts. We need to have more character communication. There needs to be more side character development. Uh, And this is not things that JKR is naturally gifted in. You see that in the earlier books. You also see that in her mystery novels, that she isn't good at the actual character development of characters. It's a weaker point in her writing. Yeah. Um, And the author or the editors around her pushed her to focus on these aspects yeah Um, the characters talk to each other in this one it's amazing (laughs) the characters talk about to each other and every single conversation is important yeah there is no like unlike the first two where there were characters talking to each other those conversations weren't dire there weren't stakes in some of them Mm there's there was always a scene pushing something forward but the tension of that conversation or how that conversation was happening or what was actually important was buried so deep down every communication between characters actually meant something even if it didn't mean something to the greater like plot but instead spoke to theme Mm -hmm. um a huge thing that we have here is like jealousy Uh, especially on Ron's part as a side character. Ron has developed a huge amount in this book because we see how jealous he is of Harry being chosen as a champion. Yeah, he's jealous of Harry. He becomes jealous of of Crumb because um, Hermione takes a liking to him um you know so very quickly ron is uh, is so tragic in this way he his his admiration towards someone turns to jealousy like on a <laughs> on a dime like he's just very but, fast for that um and and, and, it makes and you sense see it to his character too like, yeah important part yeah um, it really does it makes sense to his character and it's written in a way that it's not telling us it's showing us and it's showing us that in those conversations in the idea of like Hermione having to split time and not talking about the other person with each boy and yeah. like all of these like subtle little things that are that make a book 
feel real. Yeah, this the reality book, of the age. I agree, Kitty. Yes. <laughs> yes. This book feels real. Like that's mm-hmm. the other thing too, is that, yeah, I and maybe this is also her sweet spot as age goes, because as the characters get older, she kind of loses touch with this, even though we know editors are just as heavy handed in the further books than they are in this one. Yeah. Um. So maybe it's just this age that she's also really good at, like this 14 to 16 year old. Uh, and it's the 16 and to 18 that we lose her. Yeah. And I also think like, I mean, you kind of like, you kind of scoff at Crumb and Hermione, but for, let me just tell you, when you're that age, when you're that age, like I can totally see how, how Crumb, um, being someone that has English as a second language that is very used to, you know, people only wanting to talk about Quidditch with him and, and just be like that to be totally enamored with, with, um, winning the affections of someone like Hermione. So anyway, Crumb and Hermione supremacy, gorgeous, gorgeous girls ship Crumb and Hermione. I'm just saying, I ship Crumb and Hermione. I really appreciate the, the ship. Uh, I just think it's also, but I think it's like one of those things where it was like, we're talking about international superstar. (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Crumb <laughs> chose to bring to the Yule Ball that is a press like he already has a PR team he's an international superstar uh he's a Quidditch star he he already has a PR team and his PR team was like yes bring the 14 year old girl to the Yule Ball you're <laughs> legal and this is fine <laughs> there's nothing wrong with this and I know that obviously it ain't that deep JKR didn't need to write that, but it just brings me giggles in my head that I'm just sitting there and being like, this is what he chose. Absolutely character wise, 100% get why he would be into Hermione. There is a four year age gap and that four years is really important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, four years isn't doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're a teenager, it is it's, kind of a lot. As an adult, it's nothing. <laughs> But when one adult is 18 years old and the other one is 14, that is a college freshman dating a middle schooler. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, Maybe, probably, and, he's and, a senior. Well, he's a senior. He would be like a, um, a high school senior. Technically a senior dating a freshman, but you could stretch the ages that it well, could be. Young, I mean, the situation was freshman. he was he was a senior dating a freshman. And I mean, I knew kids like that. And and, um, you know, it's not as problematic as Twitter makes you think, but it is still a little bit weird. It, f- seniors and freshmen are, are very different. Um, it's not a reason <laughs> to cancel Harry Potter. This is fine. It's just for me. I just laugh a little bit at it. That's well, you all. also have a greater connection to kids of that age, you know, as a teacher that's, you know, working with the kids. So to me, I'm like basing it on my memories of being a high school senior and freshman. And I don't know, to me, it's like, that's very cute. Of course, Krem would like somebody that doesn't want to talk about Quidditch with him all the time. The one person. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I think that what is really special about this particular book, and maybe it's the genre shift allowing a little bit more freedom, or maybe it's just attention to feeling real. Um, the themes are actually a le- complex themes mm-hmm. are actually allowed to develop, um, yeah. whether they're known or not, <laughs> subconsciously or not. Reality goes that the more you are going to write, the more theme you are going to have in your writing and the less control of that theme you're going to have. Yep. Which um, that starts to happen in this book and it starts to happen in just really beautiful ways. And this is also a, why I also think JKR just starts to dislike Harry Potter is because in this book she has this freedom um but after this book uh she'll start to hyper focus on those themes because the fandom will relate to themes that she didn't mean to have um and she doesn't like when fandom disagrees with her interpretation of her book Mm-hmm. And then we start getting into, I mean, she's a great, she's a great case study when you're talking about like, um, you know, death of the author, um, while the author is still around to editorialize on their work. Uh, yeah. She's a wonderful case study in that because of what happened to her in relation to her fandom. Yes. And a big, a biggest example, if you like, obviously not spoilers, we're not going to get into it. We'll probably get, we'll probably talk about it in the seventh book. Um, but her view of Snape and Draco, uh, and fandom's view of Snape and Draco yeah, um, as two characters are, and she disagrees with how fandom views the Snape, how parts of fandom view Snape and how parts of fandom, fandom view Draco mm-hmm. so much so that she will and has attacked fans. Yeah. It's very um, sad. It is very another sad. reason to log off. We should have known, we should have known and been telling her to log off much sooner. 
<laughs> once you've published it, you no longer have any control. I know, I know that you are a control freak. I get it. You no longer have control. <laughs> Unfortunately. But yeah, so so for these reasons, basically, this book, in my opinion, is in a technical sense, the best of the Harry Potter books. Like if you if you're somebody that's like, you know, not read it in a long time and you just wanna you just want a moment of that Harry Potter magic again, just skip straight to the fourth book. Just read this one. Um, you'll have the best time. And here's here is the thing that I like I I I like all of the Harry Potter books third and up. I think the fourth book is the most magical as far as like it's all of her best things. I think the fifth and sixth one are still very good books and very well written. And we'll talk about that when we get there. The seventh one loses the plot a little bit, jumps the shot. Uh. <laughs> but uh, the, the fifth and sixth one are really good and follow all these things that I like in the fourth. It's just that she clutches it so tightly at that point mm -hmm. um, that it's a lot harder. But yeah. yeah, so I think that third one is a great book. This is a fantastic book. Yeah, really good. Um, and also the climax of the series. Like from here on out, things are nonstop. Everything yep. is happening. Um, but let's talk about some of those themes. One of the themes that we noticed in this reread um, brings us to our favorite part of the show. <laughs> and that's daddies and their issues. <laughs> um, there are, considering that our protagonist is not a young woman who was abandoned by her father. There are a lot of daddy issues in this book. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so many. All of the daddy so issues. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, daddy daddy issues is a huge theme in Harry Potter in general. Yeah. But like this book is just all about daddy issues from, you, from front to back. Every chapter is daddy issues, daddy issues, daddy you issues. You meet a new character and you're just like, daddy <laughs> <laughs> they're all daddy okay ludo is daddy okay um uh, let's see uh alistair moody very daddy, daddy. um <laughs> we have got hey lucius malfoy kind of daddy, but a daddy oh so daddy okay we've so got daddy. also we've also got um voldemort crying about his daddy um so who was probably daddy. the daddiest daddy we never get to meet so in my imagination i'm just gonna say he was super daddy was it? <laughs> yeah he died voldemort killed him because of his daddy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've also got <laughs> you know we've also got uh poor barty crouch jr dealing with crouch senior you know, yeah. uh, you know, ministry daddy, right? So <laughs> we got, we got so much a daddy. daddy showdown between Vernon and Arthur. Yes. After number three, people, we got a daddy showdown. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about that scene just a little bit. Um, so yeah, can we show up, put up the next? Oh, sure. I have one more joke. And then we have Mr. Are You My Daddy? Harry Potter, who looks at every oh. adult he's ever met that is male and goes, are you my daddy? And every adult sits there and goes, yes, but I'm going to abuse you and take advantage. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's true. He has Sirius daddy and Remus daddy and Arthur daddy and Dumbledore daddy. And all of them do a bad job. And his own daddy. This particular one. He, is, he is so many. So many. <laughs> so many bad daddies so many for poor bad Harry. Daddies. Anyway, let's focus on Vernon Weasley and Arthur. Yeah, so this is also in this is in chapter out. three, right? So in chapter also, three, don't take a shot every single time we say "daddy." It's been too much. <laughs> You'll die. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Arthur and the so the Weasleys come through the flu network to come pick up Harry legally this time, as as Landon mentioned. Um, she doesn't read me the summaries beforehand, so it is a delight <laughs> to hear all of the um, the ways that she describes what happens in these books. So so the Weasleys come to pick up Harry through the flu network. And there is this like showdown between Vernon and um, Arthur, where basically what you see is like Vernon is like the the bad dad who is basically just there for um, he's there for manners sake, right? Like he performs um, he performs politeness for politeness's sake. Wow. So British. And then you've got 
<laughs> and then you've got Arthur who comes in and he's trying to be genuinely polite. You know, he wants to shake Vernon's hand. He wants to have a little chat about Harry before they, you know, whisk his his um, you know, adopted son away. And uh and 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 I feel like Arthur in this scene is from Harry's perspective, so we're not privy to Arthur's thoughts, but the way that it's described, I feel like Arthur is just kind of like baffled by how this man could like be so fake. <laughs> <laughs> I think that also like it's like this idea of we have to play by the rule of young adult literature that the adults are clueless yes. and so it's like I don't understand Arthur how this boy <laughs> your sons kidnapped him in the dead of night breaking magical law because he had bars on his windows and you're surprised that the person taking care of him is an asshole. Like, I mean, it, we just got to chalk it up to genre convention because otherwise Arthur is even dumber than I think he's supposed to be. I mean, <laughs> neither Arthur nor Molly comments on like the um, objective visual abuse that is happening to Harry. I mean, I know that a lot of times adults can be dumb when it comes to recognizing if a child is abused or not, but this is overt and visual and it's, they're still like, whoosh, you know. <laughs> I think it's after, and, and actually I think that it's after this point because Arthur does have a talking to with them and the order from here on out has a talking to with them yeah. every single time. So I think that this is really like the turning point for the adults to sit there and be like, Oh, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. This is really crappy. This, this sucks. <laughs> yep. This bad. Mm -hmm. And in the fifth book, they go a lot more into detail about this. And, and as you see pretty much from this book forward, he gets pulled away from the Dursleys very, very quickly. Now, yeah. he doesn't spend a lot of time with them. Because um, I just think like, even though we have the trope of adults being clueless in YA, um, if he was spending more than a couple chapters with the Dursleys going forward, it would just kind of be like, it, was, it would just be too much. Even as a child, you wouldn't be able to swallow it, you know? <laughs> it do be true. Um, yep. But yeah, no, I really like that, that concept of polite versus genuine. And, mm -hmm. and we see that because this is also the first time we see, we see someone who has treated Harry kindly in the presence of Vernon Dursley and Petunia yeah. Dursley. Because the only other time we've seen adults around Vernon and Petunia was Aunt Marge from the last one. And she yeah. continued, and if not, escalated the abuse that mm -hmm. Harry was suffering. Um, this is the first time that we've seen Petunia and Vernon have to pretend to not be abusive to Harry. Mm -hmm. um, because even then, even the first book, where or the second book, where they have dinner guests over, they pretend Harry doesn't exist. <laughs> so like, we don't see interactions with other adults where there is a very abusive family who knows that they are abusive mm -hmm. that is trying to convince other people that they're not. And mm -hmm. that's really like the show. And I think it's also the first time Harry sees it because this is the first time Harry has remembrance of a time like this. Yep. But in, in every example that we have of these father-son relationships in this book, which is why we wanted to highlight the, the daddy issues here, is they're all abusive. Like, let's take um, Barty and his son for a moment. So Barty uh, basically goes and he has this whole plot that's explained in the book where he goes and he he breaks his son out of jail, right? Um, which, great, okay, that's cool. I understand why a father would want to do that for her son, for his son, despite what um, you know but, Junior did. But he specifically didn't do it for his son. Right. He didn't do it for his son. So um, so he goes and breaks him out, out of jail only to impose upon him house arrest. <laughs> it's um, like only to, remem to remind the people because that wasn't in the thing. He did it because of his wife's request. Yeah. So his wife was dying and asked for him to break out their son out of jail and replace him or replace her with her son so that she could yeah. die in Azkaban for her son and her son could be under house arrest. Right. And, and they use polyjuice potion to make this happen. Arrest. Yeah. Like obviously no one knew that this happened. So important, important thing to be in there because there's a whole lot of resent in that situation. Yep. I'm just going to let the dog in. But yes, yeah. so, um, so Crouch Sr. basically then brings his son home and, and immediately puts his son 
under house arrest. So he just perpetuates the same abuse, um, you know, and it's like the wife's not there anymore to stand up for for Crouch Jr. And so it's kind of like, you know, I, and I know that the Crouch Jr. was a Death Eater and that's why he was an Azkaban. So he did all these awful things, but it's like, there's no hope for him. Like there's no hope for him to ever get better or do better. Well, and also it's like this idea of he's also kept disillusioned. Yep. And under the imperious curse. Yeah. For 15, 14 years. Something like that. Something around there. Anywhere yeah. between, I think it's between 12 and 14 years. He is kept yeah. imperious. Um, which, which again is this idea of like blank, of the submissive, like totally like, and that's how it's described in the book is that mm-hmm. like, it's this, Harry describes it as like, every want you could ever have gets wiped clean and all you want to do is listen to the voice that is inside your head Mm -hmm. and so it's like this dull way of viewing the world it's it's very similar in some aspect to what actually ends up happening to him and sorry I don't want to talk about Barney Crouch where I'm getting distracted um (laughs) no but but, I mean he's a big part of the daddy issues of this book and I mean we're not spoiler free so go for it well, we have a whole thing on Barty Crouch, but it ends up happening true. with um, the Dementor's Kiss. And I'm going to yeah. cut it there because we're going to talk about Barty Crouch in a second. But I do want to talk about other daddy. Yeah. OK, like- so let's talk. Let's let's pull up another uh, get another daddy. So, um, you know, Voldemort and and Tom and slash Tom Riddle and uh, and his dad. Right. So he's named after his dad, originally Tom Riddle, which is why Voldemort has to change his name. And um, and it's a huge part of uh, of Voldemort's anger and and pushing him towards the um, you know magical people supremacy whatever you would call that that uh, that for, that forms his ideology and forms the um, you know the rampage that he goes on that that uh, hurts the Wizarding world so badly and it's all traced back to how um, how his his dad abandoned him and um, and how sad is that and it wasn't even but like that here's the thing is that. You're not helpful at this moment. Hey, kitty cat. Um, <laughs> it's not even abandoning him. Tom Riddle didn't know that she was pregnant at the time. I yeah, believe. that's I true. Remember exactly. So he was under, and what we find out later is that he is, Tom Riddle Sr., also the fact that there are so many seniors and juniors. Um, <laughs> Tom Riddle Sr. was named, was was love potioned. He, yeah. uh, Mar- Marobi, uh, Marobi Voldemort's father gave Tom R- Jr. a love potion that forced him to love her, get married in a lope, and then when she thought, oh, maybe he really truly loves me, it turns out that he it's been against his will the whole time and he leaves her because mm-hmm. he doesn't love her. She's basically just been a, she's been, you know, sexually abusing him and every yep. other and, form of And abuse. by then, by then it's too late. She's pregnant. Apparently abortions are not allowed in the wizarding world. I don't really understand that, but I guess they're not. She's, she has the baby, even though at, at that point she could have totally not had the baby, but she still does. She's, she's pregnant by this point. She's not, you yeah. know, yeah. Boys with daddy issues follow the dark Lord. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Boys with daddy issues follow the dark Lord. I mean, another, another one that we have here is, or another uh, pairing we have is, um, we don't see it as much in this particular book, but uh, Lucius and Draco Malfoy. Yeah, that I mean, my father a, will hear about this. My fa- the whole my <laughs> father will hear about this. Uh, Draco's, of course, gotta love him. His just <laughs> need for Harry's attention has expanded. Oh, I could talk about baby Draco in the fourth book all <laughs> the entire time. I will wait until the sixth book until I get my Draco, until I get my Draco. Talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a Draco um, deep dive in for the sixth book. But he has like all of these need for attention and this this boisterous thing of of everything that my father will provide everything for me. Yeah. And in this idea of like the relationship between parents and adults, big daddy issues yeah. there. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> big daddy issues. You got Harry, once again, Harry, are you my daddy? Potter. Um, and his relationship with Sirius Black which he has projected a daddy relationship onto. Like yeah. he he really has projected this idea of Sirius is there, he'll talk to me, he'll give me advice, all of these things when mentally Sirius is no older than he is. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, but he really puts him in that position and puts yeah. him there and and ha- and has him fill that role. 
And in this um, book, Lupin's not around to be like, serious, yeah. cut the shit. Like, this is Lupin, wrong. Yeah, Lupin is kind of MIA in this particular thing. And 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 Sirius is actually there. Like, he's able to be an animagi in the, in the, in the um, mountains. So they're yeah. actually able to, like, see him and talk to him and write him letters and, and all of these things. So he actually is connected to Harry in those ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's there. And I mean, that, that says something. And I think that's why, um, now the cat wants in. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's why, you know, despite everything else, despite everything else with like the, the Harry and Sirius relationship, and then Harry's relationship with his other father figures, such as Dumbledore and stuff, you know, the big difference there is that while Sirius is not often doing the best thing for Harry. Sirius is there and he's there in a genuine way and he's trying his best, which I think is commendable compared to all of Harry's other daddies. Every, yeah, all of everyone except, and I don't even think he projects on Arthur Weasley the need of like a father figure onto Arthur Weasley. I think Arthur Weasley and Hagrid and Remus to an extent yeah, are the only ones that he doesn't project that onto. Yeah. Um, I but think they still they still are they still fill a lot of those roles they, they absolutely fill those roles Hagrid because I think he's supposed to fill that friend role uh in character I think for Harry uh Arthur is Ron's dad and can't be his dad because he needs to be ostracized or at least feel a part of like that he's not a part of that family and I think that the lack of Harry feeling anything t like that towards Remus is uh jkr's own prejudices um <laughs> over oh her boy own, over her oh, own boy. very clear written dangerous to children character that's um, a take i can't say you're wrong i mean i don't know we're not in her head but uh wow i hope that's not true <laughs> i i feel that it is um mm. but yeah so he has he has these relationships the only healthy ish father-son relationship that we really get introduced to in this book is Cedric and his father and Amos yeah. mm -hmm. um and even then there's a lot of like Amos projecting onto his oldest and only child his dreams and wants and wills and and you know I, but that's very true to like father-son relationships yeah and we don't get any sense at, at any point that Cedric um doesn't agree with his father or or resents that or or anything like that like we don't we don't know obviously because we're in Hermione I mean we're in Harry's head so we don't know what Cedric is thinking but nowhere do we um get the idea that uh that Cedric is is unhappy with that or doesn't believe in that or whatever um so so from our perspective from Harry it looks at least like a very positive father-son relationship where the father really is supporting their kid as as much as he can and as best as he can and then he dies yeah so that only healthy relationship because like we don't even see much interaction between the weasley children and arthur even though we spend a good majority of the first part of the book with all of them there isn't much interaction between that father parent no. Um, or that parent child relationship. Yeah, there's there's they they inject some into the movies because it's not much there in the books. Um and yeah. and what father son um interactions that we do see in the movies is uh is very jovial. I think Arthur gets is a little overwhelmed with the amount of children he has. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how he acts um, towards them. You know, he's more interested in them as adults than he is in his sons as children. Yes. Um, so we have we have that that the only the only positive father son relationship we see is the one that ends in tragedy. Yeah. Um, and how much of this is thematically conscious? I can't say. I'm not in JKR's head, uh, but I'm not going to lie. I don't think it's a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I just think, I just think like that, I mean, it's, it's very satisfying to read. I don't know how much is on purpose versus is not on purpose. I think but, that, like um, that example of Vernon and Arthur absolutely is. Yeah. Um, I think the projection of, of Harry's need to fulfill that role in Sirius absolutely is because I feel like that, that is a, that Sirius also projects onto Harry. Uh, the need to fill the role for James. So I feel yeah. like that those are the purposeful ones, but there are a lot of daddy issues that are not purposeful. <laughs> well, like, 
and authors and authors intent um the author's intent can be interesting but i think what's more interesting is the fact that this happens you know whether it was intentional or not the yeah. best father-son relationship that we see up into this point in the series which is between um cedric and his father is uh is ripped away within the same book that it's introduced and um wow if that is not a gut punch I mean, it is an absolute gut punch when it happens, not only because the, the writing of it is very tragic, but just thematically is tragic. Yeah. And then and then we continue to go on that. Like, so if you look at it this way, too, Harry lost the opportunity of a father figure in Sirius the end of the third one. Obviously, he didn't die. Um, and it was just a pipe dream moment. But then as a reader, we read and develop a sense of of really like warm feelings for a father-son relationship in the fourth one that is wrenched away from us mm -hmm. and then we enter the fifth book where again spoilers for the fifth one um where that father-son theme that is the closest to harry that feels the most right between harry and sirius is ripped away from us again yeah. Yeah, I um, mean, and so the stuff that happens then, in the fifth book. <laughs> and then it happens again with Harry and Dumbledore yeah. in the sixth book. Mm -hmm. And then it continues to happen throughout the entire seventh one as Harry discovers the truth about Dumbledore. And yeah. so like, it's like this constant, like this is the beginning of the pattern of losing father figures that we as a reader have grown attached to. Not even as yeah. Harry as a character but we as a reader have depended on these relationships and we will start to lose them as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cause Cedric seems so cool. Like back in, back when uh, in the original read, like when this came out, you really think like, Oh, Cedric, he's, and he's helping out Harry with different tasks. And they're, they're kind of, you know, developing this sort of friendly rivalry and they're both, you know, Quidditch players and, Oh, Cedric's going to become an important character that helps fight Voldemort. Like that's what you think the first time you're reading this book, like you really do. And then He's just gone. And then he's gone. Yeah. So it's really he sad. Brings us to a little bit of a break in our episode. Yeah. All right. So here we go, guys. Um, as you guys remember from last time, we are now sponsored by Audible. And um, and Landon has a, a recommendation. But before she talks about it, I just want to pop the link in the chat. So you can start a 30 day free trial with Audible using our link, which is audibletrial.com slash interstage window. And um, and we do get a little commission if you use our link. And, uh, and so if you're interested in trying out Audible, I love audiobooks, this entire uh, series that we've been reading, everything that we read, I do it via audiobook. I try to do as little text reading as possible. I'm very slow at it. So Audible is a lifesaver. Um, so if you're interested, then uh, you can use our link to sign up. I put that in the chat for you guys. And, uh, and Landon has a recommendation for us. I do. I also have a goal to read 100 books this year. So mm. uh, if you could do that, I can buy more books. That's all. <laughs> all right. Do you want a book about daddy issues? <laughs> we love daddy issues. We do. <laughs> like, it's a trope that everyone likes. Don't lie to me. Everyone likes a little bit of a complicated relationship with their father. Well, do I have the book for you? This is The City of Bones by Cal Cassandra Clare. It is the story of uh, New York demon hunting uh, people who join in the under the like mortal underworld uh world of new york city and there is demons there are daddies there are delusional <laughs> uh heroes <laughs> there's might be a little bit of like weird shipping dynamics going on basically you follow what? the story of uh of cassie sorry forgot her name for a second uh or clary clary um as she finds out that she is actually a part of this mystical world beneath New York City uh, and that she is part of a demon slaying race and uh, that her mother is not who she seems. And it turns out that perhaps Clarissa has some issues with the dad that she never knew. So it is available on audibletrial.com slash enterstage window. It is a very good trashy series there's seven books uh side characters are much cooler than the main characters although i ship clary and jace like nobody else's business so uh 100 would recommend if you just need a trashy little young adult romance with some questionable ethics 
do I have the book for you? Well, Landon, those are all of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> and and for those and thank you so much, Luna, for um for re upping your subscription. I'm um, continuing to be our longest subscriber of 16 months. Thank you so okay. much. And um and City of Bones has a really interesting, fun backstory, um with a little bit of controversy too. So for y'all y'all that don't yes. know, City of Bones started out as fan fiction featuring Draco Malfoy and several other Harry Potter characters. Weasley. <laughs> yes. And um and that original version is no longer available because of some controversy. Um Cassandra Clow was, was a lot younger when she wrote it, made some pretty serious um ethical mistakes, etc. You can look it up. It's it's real a real fun story. Um but anyway, she took all of that down, totally reworked it into City of Bones. So the um the original draft, which is very different than uh than what we have here in the published book um, was originally some Draco fanfic. So again, daddy issues, hence. <laughs> yeah. Also, there's a queer love story involved, which I always appreciate. Mm. Uh, and some really badass female characters. So 100% mm -hmm. would, again, it's not a good series. It's just a trashy one. And I love trashy books. So <laughs> That's what you're gonna get from me. That's the, I am trash. That's the quality of my recommendations. It, but, it's a different yeah. kind of trash than than Harry Potter trash, though, right? Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. a different flavor of trash. Oh, so yeah, this yeah. One is much more steamy and a lot more us, and also <laughs> near death experiences Ooh. and maybe incest. I don't know. <laughs> Asterisk on that. <laughs> Hope that yeah, gets you curious. On the whole book. <laughs> yeah, um, hope that gets you curious. And if you are, you can um, go download City of Bones using your Audible trial uh, with our link. So there you go. Thank you all so much for listening to our ad read. Um, I hope you took the took that moment to have a bathroom break before we get back into the Harry Potter talk. <laughs> all right, we hinted about it before. Let's do it. Let's talk about. All right. Me, let's talk. Barty's let's talk about Barty's tongue. Anyway. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Here is the deal. I thought it was an incredible, this is about a movie, not the book here for a second. I thought it was an incredible acting choice done by Barty, by, uh, oh my God, what is his name? Tennant. David Tennant. David yeah, and Tennant. I, I assume David Tennant made the original choice and then yep. it was, you know, and then uh, what's his face that plays Moody copied it. His name escapes me now. Um, I, I think that's how it went down. Hate. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> um here's the deal i think it would have been much more successful if uh it had been a moody thing like if we had just thought that this was a weird moody tick and then we got a hint of it in the flashback trial beautiful the fact that it happened i the way that it happens i'm just like why this is a choice that was stupid great whatever i love it <clears throat> hate it <laughs> it's and it's weird and it's weird and quirky and i'm here for it Thank you, David Tennant, for giving us the Barty tongue. I, um, I'm here for it. David Tennant could do no wrong. However, <laughs> just how the directors introduced it, hated it. Like this scene <laughs> with Moody, with like this screenshot, worst part of the movie. <laughs> I mean, it does, it makes you, does it make you too uncomfortable? Is it like just too much? It's very uncomfortable to watch, but I think it's supposed yeah. to be. I think it's supposed to be. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so okay, so Moody. I can say about this. Yeah, so Moody, Moody and Barty. Okay, I. This is one of Do the. We um, handle these as maybe two different characters. Yeah, yeah, I think they really are. So one of the things that I really love about this book. It introduces Moody, but we don't really get to meet Moody. Who we're meeting is, of course, Barty pretending to be Moody. And yet, like, Barty is, must be, like, the best actor in the Wizarding World ever because his Moody is exactly like real Moody. <laughs> like, I, the T. <laughs> so here is my thing. I think that Barty Crouch Jr. spent so much time under the Imperius Curse that he lost parts of himself. Oh, if that makes sense. Oh, that, okay, that okay. Made it easier to not hold on to his own shit because he didn't have his own shit for uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. fifteen, th anywhere between twelve and fifteen years. He didn't have his own stuff. He had nothing. He was blank. He was a clean slate. He was basically a puppet ruled by his father, and because of that, he didn't have the instincts that like actors have to work through to sit there and be like, no, I want to do this, but what is in character? He was mm, able mm -hmm, to adapt mm -hmm. much easier because he had spent all of those years 
under that abuse. Mm -hmm. That is my hot take. That is, that is my thought. I like it. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Because I feel like in this, it's just so, it's so fun in this book. Because of course, in the next book, we meet the real Moody. And he's exactly like he was when, uh, when Barty Crouch played him. (laughs) Um, You know, he, he's, he's very helpful towards Harry doing everything he can to make sure Harry wins all the time. Um, He, he, he's, uh, he's quirky and weird and, and has like very strange ideas about what's okay for kids to do and not do in regards to violence. Um, (laughs) He's great. You know, he's great. Um, I think Moody is a fantastic character. Another one of Harry's daddies, of course. And um, and he becomes more so in later books, though. In, in this one, he really is from a teacher's perspective. And um, they don't really, they don't closely bond. They only bond a little bit in this book. They, they bond much more later. But yeah. On a writing, on a writing scale, I'm really glad that they gave us, that JKR gave us a good Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Finally! Um, because I mean we had one with Remus right but we yeah. had mediocre with Quarrel we never heard anything about it um terrible with uh terrible with Lockhart mm-hmm. really good with Remus but had to leave for reasons of, of of terribleness and had a different version of a good teacher with Moody yeah um, that he is still reckless and loud and and does inappropriate things like casting unforgivable curses on children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, learn stuff. But, the, you but like you learn life it. sentence in Azkaban, he <sighs> does several times. In one I mean, these are unforgivable minute. curses, but they can't be that illegal considering what goes on in Moody's classroom. Um, that being said, like if you were in Moody's classroom, like you learn that shit. Yeah. Like you learn it. For um, sure. And I think like that's an important part of this is that while he is being moody, he hands Harry, like you were and you were talking also about being helpful. He hands Harry every single opportunity necessary for Harry to succeed, including mm-hmm. teaching him the tools Harry needs in order to defeat Voldemort or at least escape Voldemort. In in the graveyard, mm-hmm. so and like, and it's because and it's because Barty's such a rule follower, right? Like his orders are make sure Harry wins and makes it to the graveyard, right? Yeah. And so he fo- and he follows that like to a T to the point that he follows it too well, and Harry does make it to the graveyard, but then he escapes. Yeah, and he escapes based off of the things that Moody taught him. Yeah, taught him how to throw off an imperious curse. If Harry had never had the imperious curse put on him, he would have experienced and and hadn't had to work through it. The like I think he worked through it three times in Moody's classroom or mm-hmm. whatever before he was able to deny it. If this had in the graveyard had been the first experience that he deals with the imperious curse, he would have died. Yeah, uh, but Alistair Moody, being Alistair Moody, who's actually Barty Crouch gave Harry those tools. Mm -hmm. He taught him, uh, he didn't teach him Expelliarmus, but he taught him the proper way of dueling. Um, And in order to use his dueling skills the same way that he does in the graveyard. Like it really is this interesting choice that this man also sets up everything as far as like making Hagrid show him the dragons, um, giving Dobby the idea of gillyweed, Mm -hmm. um, of of slipping like- what? That's another, that is another movie oh. change that I really like is having Neville be the no. one that, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to yeah. argue about House Elves in a little while. but no. I know, but Neville doesn't get to do crap in these books. So giving him one of Dobby's parts, I think is a good thing. Um, and Dobby out. <laughs> Just you know what? They had to cut so much Neville stuff from this. and. <laughs> And I agree. I understand what you're saying about like cutting Dobby entirely. And I don't necessarily agree with the movie cutting Dobby entirely because then we don't really get, you know, much. We don't really get the interesting thing we're going to talk about with the house elves next. But I do think it's wonderful that the movie didn't forget about Neville because the books so often forget about Neville. But I have a feeling that it wasn't like, let's give Neville time to shine. It was probably more like we don't have the budget and we don't want to deal with the slavery of it all. Um, so who can you know what let me have this it's a change I like it's a change I like no and I think that I mean I think it was a change of convenience rather than a purposeful one but 
Yeah, but it's good, and it should have been like that in the books, too. I can accept that you like it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Anyway. Neville's a great character, and he doesn't get nearly enough in the books. That's true. Um, (laughs) anyway. (laughs) Marty Crouch. Uh, No, so Moody coming in as this wild, wild or who survived several world war, who survived several wars, um, who the ministry thinks is a bit of a hack, but is also just incredibly useful as a teacher mm-hmm. is awesome. And then he also yeah. has like these cool ass things, like this magic eye that can see through everything. Kind of creepy, but can see through everything, including invisibility cloaks. Yeah. Um, which is really cool and you get some more of these defense and again it is building out the world it is it, this character it, the interactions we have with this character are so cool because they play to Hermione's or Hermione's they play to JKR's strengths rather than than um having to actually develop a character mm-hmm. because- and I do like and I do like we get a glimpse into how the Wizarding World does deal with um, things like disfigurement and, and disability, yeah. um, which is interesting. I find that very interesting, you know? Um, yeah. So, so you know, it's it's just, it's a beautiful piece of world building, Moody's Eye. Yep. And and we learn, like, through, through this and through later books um, that Moody just, I mean, we don't really ever learn about his background. He is a side character that remains to the side. But he has dedicated his whole life in every aspect of his life to fighting dark wizards. Yep. Um, like he jokes about how, like, in a flashback in the pensive, he jokes about how like Rosier takes off a like takes off a scar on his face. Mm-hmm. That fighting these dark wizards is what has made him look so disfigured. Um, so he's wearing the scars of his service to safety in the world on him. Mm -hmm. um and the and the world thinks he's crazy for it yeah and it's just it's really interesting because we get that self-sacrificing character and we see that that's how harry is being painted but because harry i think harry and moody have a lot in common yeah i mean Um, here moody is obviously and you get this much more in later books moody as a character is obviously intended to be like here's a glimpse into your future harry yes yeah yeah exactly um and we see it I think a little bit in this book and I appreciate that sort of character mm-hmm. because there isn't another one like him. No, like no Harry really. isn't ever going to be the Dumbledore. Um, and you kind of know that like before you even know who Dumbledore is. Um, but he might be the Moody. Uh, and a part of me actually hopes that Harry would have gotten therapy and after everything (laughs) would have gotten therapy and would have realized this with his therapist and would have been like maybe I don't have to be moody maybe I can also have some balance like family (laughs) I'm not sure therapy (laughs) exists in the wizarding world but (laughs) literally let the world disfigure me to the point where I seem crazy to the press Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep (laughs) Yep, and I think that also shows like Moody was such a well-known person that um, that Barty was able to to get enough information about him to easily copy him, right? That's how well-known he was for being crazy and being weird like that. So he's like the perfect target for someone like Barty to come and, in. And like not even because like that's the other thing too is it's casually getting because yeah. Barty Crouch had to casually over the course of several months get information about this person because he was still living under the orders of his father hmm yep yep so it's it's very tragic it's very tragic what happens to Barty and I think and it, I, I find it very sad I find it very sad that, she, that we have all of the characters all of the characters that do these bad things in a book that is about that is about like um like hope and being better and and things like that um we have all these these characters that are really put in these boxes where they have absolutely no opportunity to ever be better and so we never know if they they could have or if they want to and Barty's yeah. a really good example of that. Yeah, so we learn in the flashback that um, Barty is the youngest of the convicted Death Eaters for torturing Neville's parents, Alice and mm-hmm. Frank Longbottom. Um, he's the youngest. He looks scared and nervous. To be honest, he probably was just newly a Death Eater. Um, and 
he is then being judged by the father that you can tell he was never enough for. Um, and it's like this really interesting dynamic of, yeah, he, he is a young, just out of Hogwarts kid who then gets sentenced to a life in Azkaban and then is broken out of Azkaban and forced to be nothing but a puppet, a meat, a meat puppet for 15 years, Mm -hmm. um, and treated cruelly by his father. Yeah. It's literally, it's literally like there, there could not have been a worse possible situation for, for Barty. and the first and only time we see him outside of this box of being literally forced to do what he has to do um, is when he is moody. And like, that's the thing is like, yes, I think he's acting like Moody, but I think that Harry didn't know Moody. So in all those one-on-one conversations while he was acting like Moody, I think that there was a bleed of, of Barty Crouch in there. Um, and that's what makes him fascinating is at the end of the day, Barty Crouch helped Harry. Um, and maybe he didn't mean to, but he did. Mm-hmm. And he rescued, he saved Harry in a way. And yeah. it would have been cool to see what would have been developed of him, except then um, he receives the Dementor's kiss. Yeah. And, and never get to see uh, that. he becomes... A, he becomes what his father had kept him as for years, which is the soulless shell yeah. of a human being. And now it's permanent. Uh, and now it is that he is gone completely rather than it being what someone else is forcing upon him. Yep. Rereading these books and, um, and taking a look at the character of Barty Crouch makes me so excited to get to the part of the books where we uh, get to meet and understand more about Regulus Um, because he is a quite similar character uh, which very different uh, events end up happening to and you get to see some other possibilities for this situation it's a really popular ship that you said that Mm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) no I agree I think that waiting to see um, waiting to discuss Regulus I'm very excited about I think also and this kind of leads into next week uh, we're or not next week but the week after next um, we're focusing almost almost we're gonna do it the Almost. Yeah. So we are going (laughs) to soon. So we had to change our schedule up a little bit, of course, um, because the COVID rained on our parade. But we are going to do our fandom episode for this one on the 5th of February. And it is going to be all about Death Eaters. So we're going to do a deep dive into our headcanons and um, and thoughts and opinions on the concept of as well as individual Death Eaters, the way they exist in the in the Harry Potter world and um you know so we're gonna it's a whole episode about wizard kkk so if that's your thing um join us on the fifth <laughs> i think what that will do is it i mean and it'll and we'll be able to discuss regulus there too and the other death eaters as an example but i think that what this shows is like not to be death eater sympathetic because they are still nazis and terrible people yeah, um, and unfortunately the only way to cure a nazi is you know what i'm not gonna say it because i'll get tos <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think that I think that showing the showing the flaws in the wizarding world and what led to some of these Death Eaters being Death Eaters uh, and how they were treated, I think will be very interesting because there is yep. a lot of abuse that happens in a lot of these families. Yeah, and and the, the way to know to not become a fascist yourself is to understand how fascists are created. So yes. We're going to talk. About and that. also. Go to therapy. Please. <laughs> All right. Realize so that the world is not about you. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but let's but let's talk about what the world is about. Um <laughs> which is Quidditch. <laughs> My God. Okay, so we have two for the first time, this is the first book that we see events that affect the world outside of Hogwarts. Mm-hmm. Um, we see something that is like mass wizarding events. This is the first time we see it. And the first one is the Quidditch World Cup, uh, which I, because I have no idea how soccer and football in the UK and other parts of the world play, I don't understand (laughs) what the Quidditch World Cup is and why it only happens every three years and what the fuck is happening. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I try every time I come to this like explanation, I'm like, I am missing the context 
of not understanding how soccer works. Yeah, same. But this is so fun. So well, like Quidditch as a game is a is um supposed to be commenting on rugby. Like the rules of Quidditch are supposed to be making fun of rugby. The concept of Quidditch is obviously making fun of the way that soccer exists in the UK. Um, which I don't understand, but I find the Quidditch World Cup scene as as brief, as annoyingly brief as it is in the movie, uh, incredibly fun and, uh, and fun to watch. And it's also really fun to read. Like I love, and again, we get some cool inventions with the like Omna oculars that can like repeat time in the book. Yeah, I want it's one. Those sounds so adventure. cool. <laughs> and it is a really cool, it's really, really fucking cool. Like it's it's a great scene and it's great written and it's an amazing hook as far as like exposition and introduction to the world and on a literary sense it it fits the YA genre we learn a lot from it we don't we also have fun with it like it is a really great and important part of the book um, but I just don't understand it because I'm just like aren't there teams why is this happening. I'm so confused. Yeah, so, so British British people watching this on YouTube, explain it to us in the comments because we love yeah. it, but we can't tell you why. I know that like soccer <laughs> has different tiers, and I think that like the the country national teams are part of that different tiers, but like also there are smaller. I don't understand. Anyway, I don't need to understand it to know that I like this part of the book. Um, but that every like this is like the this is like the Super Bowl mm-hmm. for, to be an American, the Super Bowl of Quidditch that only happens every three years and it's not happened in, in, in Great Britain in a very long time. And so the fact that they all get to go and celebrate and see this is amazing and a once in a lifetime opportunity. And they go and have this like camp out and it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And I love the logistics. So can I just say like, I love the logistics of it, of how they like yeah. actually take the time to talk about like how, what the things that they have to go through to gather all was all these wizards in one place. Um, the way that their, their tents are bigger on the inside. Wonderful Doctor Who reference there. I love that. Um, it's just like, I, I just love the world building here and what also- it adds to the wizarding world. It adds to, and that's the thing, right? Is that we have, I feel like that we learned, that was something that was so magical about the first book is that we learned about the wizarding world. We learned about all of these things. And then we had to settle. We had to settle into Hogwarts. And that's part of what I didn't like about the second one so much is that it was Mm -hmm. so focused on Hogwarts. At least with the third one, there were some concepts of magic and some concepts of- Yeah, like Animaguses and things like that. Yeah. that even like even like the treatment of werewolves and stuff like that expanded mm-hmm. the world maybe in ways that I didn't like but it expanded the world a little bit this really like we're back to expanding the world this is the most yeah. expansive of the world that we have had since the first one and frankly the most expensive of the world that we'll get until the seventh one yeah um that this is really expanding everything about we what we know about the wizarding world um, which is why it's kind of like this shock moment to have this first scenario in which we see the wizarding world as a whole in a major event. And there's just casually some KKK Death Eater members. Yeah, with their masks on and stuff, just like having a, getting a little too drunk and reliving the heyday is literally the like very close to the line that Arthur Weasley says you can <clears> stay <throat> in the tent it's just a bunch of people who just got too drunk and are reliving the heyday like by torturing muggles like it's just so casual even now in the wizarding world to just torture muggles that it's like oh it's a group of people that just got too drunk uh-huh Big oof, um, big yikes. Uh, um, yep. <laughs> and what I like about it is that it's never expanded upon. Like we, like we are told that in the world of Hogwarts, the idea of saying the word mudblood is so rehensible and so gross and terrible and ugly. But there are actively at wizarding events a group of people torturing other people and it's just a drunk Saturday night. Like, yep. like it just doesn't, com- it doesn't click and compute into the same world. And I, and it like, it makes it feel like, okay, what? 
<laughs> well, it see, it would, it would if any of this affected Harry. So I think about like major things that have, that I've experienced in my life surrounding like you know big concept things that I can't control as an individual, such as bigotry, such as like the economy, such as you know politics, whatever. And when I've had those experiences, they have affected me and built an ideology. And this is something that you'll hear me start to complain about in later books, not so much in this book, because I don't feel like Harry's ready for that. But I feel like after he has this, these experiences that he has in this book, what happens at the Quidditch World Cup being one of them, he should start developing like a framework for what he thinks is like the right way to run the world. You know, all all kids go through this, all teenagers start to think about these things and often, often they make wrong decisions, but Harry doesn't think about this ever. He never thinks about things like, why is this even happening? How did this come to be? You know, what if what if somebody else ran the world that could do it better? You know, what rules would you put in place? What laws would you put in place to make this stop happening? He never thinks about that stuff ever. And it's very frustrating because this is a major experience that he is directly involved in because he gets accused because, you know, the wand stuff that happens. Yep. Um, and so this would affect him, but but it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't affect him. And um, it's also the never explained to him and therefore never explained to the audience. Mm -hmm. Like, here's the other thing, too, is that you don't need to have Harry in order to be a successful protagonist and this still affect him. You don't need to have him be the part of the class that is being threatened, right? You, we don't need a muggle-born Harry in order to understand muggle-born issues and how the Wizarding World treats muggle-borns. Yeah, we but have we, Hermione. She already does that. Needs, Explain it to Harry, mm -hmm. or at least make it feel important. They yeah. did that in the second one with this idea of mudblood. Mm -hmm. They never did it again. They mm -hmm. never did it again. And then all of a sudden we're hit with this and we're hit with it with such casualness that it's like, okay. Yeah, and Rowling never, never in the prose anywhere brings up you know, that, what Harry might think about this. No one ever turns to Harry and, and says anything um, really about it after the scene happens. It's just kind of, it's gone. Um, yeah. It doesn't really affect his mind in any way. And I just don't agree with that. Well, and then there's this big turn of events too, that it goes from like, oh, torturing muggles is fine. But seeing a sigil in the sky is what throws everything into chaos. It's very real world in that way. It's all about like the symbolism, not about the actual effect on people. Absolutely. How? Yes, but also like it's never like that. That yes, it's very real, but also at the same time, I feel like it's it's not handled properly. No, but it's it's real in a way that like I don't think um, J.K. Rowling or unfortunately enough of her editors realized that it felt too real and nobody That's commented on on it. Yeah, because yeah. um, we no can commentary. think of examples. Yeah, we can think of examples in in our real life where you know uh, some kind of symbolic violent uh, gesture, such as a signal in the sky, was given great importance. Whereas um, you know an, an overt violent gesture that cost you know many more lives than the symbolic one gets like it's whatever it's whatever I mean, you know you can also think of it as retaliation too like the very yeah. the very real of like um the shooting of black people mm -hmm. by cops mm -hmm. and the retaliation of um riot like someone burning down a building. yeah that yeah, we burning put, like, all down this emphasis. of the building that doesn't cost anybody's lives is held higher than that of which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's literally saying this building is more important than a human and that's just um, ridiculous this symbol of the yeah. dark mark is more evil than the torturing of muggles yeah uh, and yeah children. it's very much like that it's very much like that and it's 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 that sim it's like that disconnect and it does happen a lot like the idea of uh, of gangs of like the idea of in schools this is a very real one for me the idea of in schools of wearing gang symbols is more important and more highlighted than kids being in gangs like there is like no way especially in inner city schools there are like no there are very little like ways that admin try to stop or change what is happening, but yeah. they will sit there and get a kid kicked out of school for wearing the wrong, for wearing a bandana that might be gang affiliated. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's like that symbol is more important than the action. 
Yep. And um, considering how many other topics we have and the amount of time we have, I think unfortunately we have to move from here. Um, You're good. I'm just trying to, we've been so good on time. I'm trying to have us not run over. (laughs) Um, And then we have the Triwizard Tournament, which Mm -hmm. takes place at Hogwarts, but brings in people within the larger wizarding world, not even just Britain, but the larger wizarding world in general. Yeah. It's like, oh, there are other wizarding schools in other countries. Of course there are. This is amazing. That's where you learn about the other countries. That's where you learn about the other customs, the other forms of magic. And not only that, but then we get adults. We get adults coming to Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. We get like Charlie with the dragons Mm -hmm. and, you know, the adults of Madame, and I know that she's obviously- Uh, Madame Maxine. But Madame Maxine and Igor Karkaroff and, and all of these other people that exist in the wizarding world we're learning more about that Mm -hmm. um and it's it's really cool that you see both of these events happen in the fourth book where it is like oh this is taking place outside of school and involves the wizarding world Mm -hmm. and there's something that takes place inside of school that also involves and expands the wizarding world yeah because they get to Um, visit like molly and everybody comes to visit to cheer harry on and you know and it's just it's just wonderful like this book is really wonderful for the world building um and i wish that we had continued this trend in the other books of having things you know more outside of hogwarts and i don't mean in the way that in the seventh book they run around the woods i mean in like this way you know And I think we get a little in the fifth as we start gearing up for the war, but mm-hmm. even then there's more opportunity that I wish I had done. And what this really yeah. does is it really, it really world builds and it's an amazing part of what makes this book exciting because yeah. even though like you could have a, there could hypothetically be a Triwizard tournament that took place with just Hogwarts students um, and it would be just as effective, but because we have those other schools involved, Mm-hmm. It makes it feel bigger. It makes it feel more yeah. important. And I'll mention a, so, here, I've, I've praised some of the changes from the movie, so I'll mention a stupid one. The fact that they made the schools um, single gender, it makes no sense. Um, I hate that. Uh, hate why? It. Stupid? What? Also, because like, nah. anyway, yeah. uh, the single Blah, gender, indeed. I will fight that every step of the way. Fight it mm-hmm. with all of my things. Um, Bad change bad change but of course we needed the pretty girls and the strong boys and i mean the scene is really cool and i mean when when they come in and they're like do do with the stat like i mean oh, it so looks cool, cool as fuck and, like, and the viewer also- come in and they're like ah oh, you know the the bobaton girls are like ah oh, and like it looks cool and it sounds beautiful but like it's just dumb like conceptually this is dumb it's so dumb all right yeah. moving on yes moving on Okay. We have a very extra long spot the problem. <laughs> Which is why I was pushing Landon forward. Like, I think we need this whole 30 minutes to talk about all the spot the problem. So so here's problem one. House elves don't make sense. Um, here, Landon, I'll go ahead. And I'll take this one a little bit since um, we've been talking about this. So in this book, we're introduced. We, we have a Dobby has a decent role. And we also are introduced to Winky, who is the Crouch's um, elf and uh, and for different reasons, both Winky and Dobby are no longer employed by their masters. Right, they both end up employed by Hogwarts, and so you have this situation where um, Dobby is kind of outcast from his people because he starts to believe like, hey, maybe I should get a wage for for my work. Maybe I shouldn't be forced. Maybe there should be regulations about what I can do and what I can't do and how many hours I should work and all of these things. Like he starts to get these ideas and he and he 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 dresses in the ways that wizards do, very flamboyant. And this is one this is another I really don't like this about the movies. They put him in that stupid potato sack, but in the books he's described like wearing these ridiculous crazy clothes. I wish we had seen well, that, Dobby. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we don't we don't see him until the seventh one with that. Uh, right, but the, he but he was doing it here. It just it just wasn't written in my mind. It wasn't written, but he's doing it. He's oh, definitely yeah. Yes, and this I mean this is concept art I think from the second one. Yeah, um, it is. But uh, no, but, but he I'm starts to wear like, like real clothes. He starts also, to wear real clothes. I also fear in terms of the they made that choice as far as the movie goes because it had been mm-hmm. so long. Yeah. Since we had seen him, that if we had had an elf appear in multicolored socks, we would have been like new elf. (laughs) We would have been like, who the fuck is this? (laughs) Yeah. So, so we have Dobby in, in the, in the book, right? So he's starting to explore like what it might mean for him to be a free elf and what that might mean for house elves. And then you have Winky who, um, is not ostracized from her people. She behaves in what they feel is 
proper, which is to feel shame that she is no longer um, a slave, right? So she was she was kicked out of her master's house. She was the Crouch's house elf um, because of her involvement with the stuff that went wrong at the tournament with the Death Eaters, right? Just to give you a, a very short summary. Um, it's not really important. Uh, but basically, she she loses her employment. Um, Dumbledore takes her in, says, eh, no worries, you can work at, uh, at Hogwarts, it's all good. And, uh, and she is very ashamed by this. And um, the house elves all basically in totality side with Winky and say, this is how you should behave. You know, you don't be free, which just doesn't, it doesn't make any fucking sense. These are sentient beings. There is no way that out of all the house elves employed at Hogwarts, that not a single one went up to Dobby and was like, you know, dude, I know that like, they're treating you bad, but like you actually have some points. Can we talk about this? Like, there's no way. Even just like complimented his socks. Something like something <laughs> to show that like not every single house elf believes that Dobby's thoughts are wrong because that's realistic. No sentient being is okay with slavery. None. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And like. We even find out in this book that on some level, J.K. Rowling understands that because that point is made in regards to giants that like, you know, we need to reach out to the giants first. We need to get them on our side first, because if Voldemort is back, that's one of the first places he's going to go, you know, and um, and we don't want them siding with him in, in general. And so even though giants are portrayed as this relatively um, violent race that is harmful towards wizards in general, they understand that that doesn't mean that that is like their permanent state, right? But apparently when it comes to a race that is typically slaves, that is their permanent state and they can't understand better or be convinced that they could have a better life. It makes no sense. And it just drives me crazy because Hermione is right. She's right. And then the house elves themselves in this book, tell her she's wrong, which is not what would happen. It's not. It doesn't even make any sense within the context of the book because no other race behaves this way. No other race lives up to their stereotypes the way the house elves do. Doesn't make sense. It does not. Um, and just like the whole, I think it's so... I mean, obviously, we we got signs of it in the second one. It was mentioned a little bit throughout the third. It will continue to be mentioned. However, it is the worst in the fourth because we do have the direct comparison of what a good elf should look like. Yeah. Uh, with Winky, who is literally coming into alcoholism because she is viewed as a bad elf since she is freed. Yeah. And that, like, like, yeah, just doubling down in that whole, like, I want to be owned so bad, and I am only a good elf if I am owned, and, but not in a to teach the reader a lesson sort of way, but as a way of, like, explaining how the world works. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like, there's, it's like the inevitability. Slavery is an inevitability. And that's just, I just, I'm sorry, but that is, like, such a, that is such, like, to me, uncreative way of thinking and i expect more out of artists than just like saying well this is the way the world is that sucks oh well <laughs> yep. and then the only example of like the only person really fighting for this cause is treated so poorly not only amongst the house elves like the house elves like refusing to clean her room or like being really disappointed or really scared or nervous about the fact that she's leaving clothes everywhere Hermione um as she but also everyone else in the wizarding world is like that she meets and tells about this is making her feel like she's ridiculous mm -hmm. and then the fact that it is never it is only mentioned casually from here on out it is a casual plot point from here on out really yeah and by the way and, and by the way, um, spoilers for like the, literally the very end of the series, the last line of the series, but it's relevant here. So we're going to talk about it here. Um, you probably don't remember this because you blocked that awful epilogue from your mind. But the very last line of the entire series is Harry talking about how glad he is to have a house elf. 
No way. Yes, it's about creature getting him a sandwich. I swear oh, to God. Well, it's not the last. It's not the last line. Of- yeah, it's like literally oh, on the you last mean page. Before the epilogue. Yeah. No, it's in the epilogue. The epilogue. I'm pretty sure it's in the epilogue. No, he go, goes, go. No, he goes upstairs after the battle. He goes upstairs and he's like, "I'm gonna go to bed and go to sleep, and then creature's gonna make me a sandwich because they're at home." Yes, that's the line I'm thinking of. But that's that's not in the epilogue. That's after. It's the not battle. in the epilogue. And to be okay. Fair, they are at Hogwarts. <laughs> but yes, it's the it is it is yes. Um. I don't think Harry has, he does not have a house elf after everything. Hopefully not. Well, I will have, we'll get to that point and I'll reread it and we'll, I'll find the exact line that I'm talking about. But yeah, I, um, yeah. Kitty says, I wonder how much she expected people to care. Like for her, this was a side note. Yeah, um, I think so. And I think it really shows that JK Rowling um, has the inability to imagine a better world. She believes the best world that we, that humanity could possibly create is the one that we exist in right now. Um, yes. pa- past worlds are bad. But we cannot improve beyond right now. And um, and I just, I expect more from creative people. I just do. And maybe that's misplaced. And um, and maybe creative people aren't, you know, as smart as I like to think that they are. But it just, it pains me. It pains me that she cannot imagine anything better than what we have right now. And this this shows it. The house will well, show it. Well, I think that's just what this really, really shows is someone who has no fine understanding of what slavery is. Mm-hmm. and the history of slavery and it's really easy to just write slaves into any story i mean look at almost any fantasy novel yeah most it. fantasy series have slavery um but the successful ones the believable ones are the ones that have reason for that yeah have history built into that who have taken the care and time to develop all of that we as readers, she might have, she might have the ideas of how house elves came into being slaves by the wizarding folk, but mm-hmm. we are never privy to that information. Mm-hmm. Even as she's editorialized and added with Pottermore, we are never privy to the information as far as why house elves are house elves. Mm-hmm. So it really is just like this plot, we're going to put it in there. And it's always been like that and no one cares to change it except for the person who's ostracized from this world because that's not the world that she grew up in. And even then, it's treated like a joke. Yeah. But see, Um, Hermione says that, but like Harry didn't grow up with wizards. He should think slavery is abhorrent. And yet... Why? Harry was the designated servant. (laughs) (laughs) So he thinks it was good enough for me. It's good enough for you. (laughs) Harry doesn't give a shit about anything. He's so well, nice about everything <sighs> but the girls that he thinks are pretty and Draco Malfoy and sometimes Voldemort. And well, he- I mean, he does have emotions. I mean, he has a lot of anger inside of him. But anyway, yes, I, I totally think like this. Due you're right. It's a colonist take on slavery. Draco Malfoy. <laughs> anyway. I mean. <laughs> Part two of Spot the Problem. <laughs> Bathrooms. Um, there is so much bathroom talk in this one. So so here's here's like a blink. There's a blink and you miss it line when Harry. So before we get to Rita Skeeter, just real quick. Oh, there's a blink and you miss it. You're good. There's a blink and you miss it line where Harry is considering who he wants to ask to the Yule Ball, where he wants to ask Cho, but he feels like he can't do it when she's around her friends. That's too embarrassing, whatever, whatever. And he has this thought about how he's going to go corner her in the bathroom. Yeah, I swear to God that happens in this book. And I, when I read it, I had to I had to like pause my audiobook and rewind and play it again. And I'm like, did Harry just literally think about asking a, this girl out by cornering her in the bathroom? I, I, I that's just not a normal thought. That is not a normal a, thought. Far before Tram's bathroom rights were a thing, so it's just fascinating. Well, yeah, um, I mean, at that time, at that time, you know, it wasn't it wasn't politicized. Trans people just used the bathroom, and no one really thought about it. The other thing is, is this is the more awkward scene uh, that if you think too hard about it, you're going to be really confused by the implication of all of this. And that (laughs) is what is featured on the screen of uh, the prefix bathroom in general, just like love the idea that we didn't know that there was Roman style bathing until where all like all the prefix could take the bath at the same time until this book. Um, But at the same time, you got moaning myrtle the horny teenage girl who's spying on boys taking baths Mm -hmm. like not only is she spying on harry she at least lets harry know that she's there she legit just spies on cedric diggory 
Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't talk to him or anything. And if it was only this, if this was the only bathroom thing, I would just think like, oh, Moaning Myrtle is this weird bored girl and she's a ghost and she can only do so much and so it's whatever. But this is not the only weird bathroom thing. But also, you would think, first of all, you'd also think that like the school would do something about it. <laughs> you'd think, you'd like, think. Like a girl, like peeping Tom shit, not cool. Um, I mean, they yeah, constantly it's... talk about how they're trying to do better with Peeves. Why aren't they constantly talking about how they're trying to do better with Moaning Myrtle? This is obviously not the only bathroom thing. Because, like, also, remember, this, most of the second book took place in a girl's bathroom. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's some there's some bathroom issues uh, in this book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just... Mm-hmm. Just give and I know, and I mean, I, I was in middle school and high school, you know, things went down in the bathroom. So I'm not saying featuring bathrooms in these books are, are bad necessarily, but there is one in particular piece that I think really calls all the bathroom stuff into question, and that is Rita Skeeter. So this is the book where um, Hermione and all of her genius figures out that Rita Skeeter can animagus into a bug, and that's how Rita Skeeter is able to know all of the things that she knows to be able to report on, right? This is also the first time we meet her too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We meet her in this. As the personification of all of um, Harry's issues with uh, with the press. <laughs> not the press, because the press is represented in this of how the wizarding world views Harry. Yes. This is very, because there hasn't been press. Other than, there has with Lockhart. Yeah, the second book. But Harry was never the singular subject of press in like there was never paparazzi there was never anyone trying to reach out and get his like name or his autograph it, what, it, a little bit during the second one but this is the first time it that ramps up it it is really ramps up and it is obvious that what it is being used as is a tool into how the wizarding world as a whole views harry yeah um it, it is a clever literary device so that we understand how the wizarding world as a whole is talking to her- about Harry. Yeah. And it's um, Rita Skeeter turning into a bug and spying yes. on him in the bathroom. So yeah, so it's yeah. It's this <laughs> whole it's this whole concept of the whole wizarding world views you boiled down into wh- how the press takes you, even more boiled down to how does this one woman take you? Mhm. And then knowing that everything is being manipulated by this one woman giving a lot of power to this person who is not kindly talked about yeah um and described in a very fascinating way Mm -hmm. um yep and and then of course yeah spying on him in bathrooms and in classes and and other people no and uh the bullies he'll talk she'll talk to the bullies about him and all of these kinds of things and we find out and like in, this is something where jk rowling's um you know anti-trans twitter tirades uh really you can't read rita skeeta another way after seeing the actions that rita takes and seeing what jk rowling thinks about trans women when you read her physical description it is very obvious that J.K. Rowling was imagining a caricature of a trans woman because she's described as um, as having large mannish hands. She's described as um, wearing flamboyant garish clothes, kind of like drag queen style. She doesn't use the word drag queen, but that's the way it's described. She's um, described having garish makeup. She's described, you know, with everything is like adorned in this like very bright emerald green that uh, that accompanies Rita Skeeter. She is the only character who in the entire series that we have met that is actually a caricature yeah like even uh, maybe the only other time that there was like a character that was more caricature than character was Dumbledore in the first half of the first book yeah I would say Dumbledore in the very beginning was more caricature than character because he gets developed pretty pretty well going forward and then the other one I would say is um Dolores Umbridge in a lot of ways is more caricature than character um but but, but, uh, but then again well, Dolores she... Umbridge isn't introduced until after Rita Skeeter so we right had, we've had three and a half books Mm-hmm. Since the last caricature, like truly underdeveloped character, 
Yeah. Has entered and has been important. Right. So, you know, it's one of those things where like upon first reading it, you think like, wow, Rita Skeeter is just an awful person. And it is just impossible now rereading it to not think about some of J.K. Rowling's worst tweets. Yep. It's impossible, unfortunately. Yep. So um, tragedy, tragedy of Rita Skeeter. Um, you know, I, I just think I just think the, the description of her, uh, if you were writing something like this today, then probably your editor would say, you need to change the description. You can't have the character doing these things and then having their appearance described like a drag queen. You just can't. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just is, again, this, there is never, like, obviously there are characters that are never put in a good light in the book series, but even from right off the bat, there is an intense dislike, not even from Harry, but from the actual description of herself for Rita Skeeter. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's and, never and shown whether positive. Whether it be tr her transness or her drag or very like drag queen-esque or whatever it is that JKR was projecting onto this character, there is, there is bleed through. Like there's character bleed into this character. It feels like there is. And I wouldn't have said that before. I would have said, you know, that's projection. We don't know what's in her mind. But now that we do know for this particular topic, what's in her mind, it's kind of undeniable. There's a lot of character bleed. Yeah. Um, and obviously there is no, there is no can't like confirmation that, that Rita Skeeter is trans. Like she never came out and was like, oh, I have a trans Skeeter, a trans character in Rita Skeeter or something like that, which would have just been the nail on the coffin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because according to JKR, trans people don't exist, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> but like, obviously, um, that is something that is part of all of this of just man I can't wait to talk about Tonks I can't wait to talk about Tonks I next time I can't wait to talk about Tonks either <laughs> <laughs> sorry this is no. Tonks is one of those missed opportunity characters where we could have really explored the way thinking. that gender and gender presentation works in the wizarding world and it was totally missed this is a planning conversation that we're having live here on stream sorry um, <laughs> this next this next fandom is death eaters the one after that should be order of the phoenix members so oh my god it's gonna have to be and everybody in depth so we can talk about tanks right. and then obviously we talked about the bathroom spying so that's spot yeah. the problems number two and to round it out with spot the problems number three let's bring it in for misogyny <laughs> oh my god <sighs> fleur. Um, fleur delacour deserves better yeah she absolutely better than anyone in she's any beautiful world. she's smart she's strong <laughs> and no one cares i'm no one cares so sorry joanna that you never felt pretty in school i am so sorry that you felt inferior to other women please stop projecting on it um jesus christ so like the biggest thing about Fleur, even though she is a successful, smart, kind, empathetic, caring, passionate character. That is and she's strong too. Like she does, she does a strong, good job yeah. in that, in the tri Triwizard Tournament. Like Fleur yeah. basically has everything. She's still, she really does. She's everything. Everybody, every single character for the rest of the time that we meet her is so hyper-focused on her looks and projecting beliefs onto that, that even the author loses the point of this character. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think that we, I don't think it's as important in this one because she is clearly a background character. Yeah. Um, I think what is important in this particular book is that JKR invented a race of people for the sexual pleasure and viewing of men obviously that this yeah. has happened many times by the way me, by the way everything like that i have a and question also, i, I have a really big question slut, just have to say that anyway where are the lesbians where <laughs> are they <laughs> so you've got this no school so you've Come got on. this school full of hormonal teenagers and you're telling me not a single one of those girls 
is bi or lesbian or prefers feminine people or anything like that. I don't know what to tell you, Karen, other than gay people don't exist. I just, I can't. Like, come on. Even the, the straightest, even person... like you get the, okay, but, you, but if, the thing is, is they're, they're hormonal teenagers, okay? You take the straightest group of girls, the straightest group of girls in high school, and you know what, you know what, and you show them like a really sexy lady, they're going to think it's sexy. I'm sorry. Like, do you not remember what it was like to have all those hormones in your body? I have a head cannon. Do you want to hear okay, my Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. I think Molly Weasley hates Fleur Delacour so much. Because she has a big old fat lesbian crush on her. <laughs> Can I get that fanfic? Hey, A M three Fleur slash Fleur slash Molly. No Let's reason. see if it exists. Let's she see if this never, exists. She has never been any sort of judgmental, as far as we've seen, with any other partner of her children, except for Fleur. It's because yeah. she's so fucking pretty. So I know um, that comes in a comes in a later book, but if for for you guys that don't remember, Fleur gets with um Bill, right? Oh, That's the one that yeah. she gets with. Yeah. And Molly and Molly is not about it. Yeah, she um, hates it. Which I'm sure we'll talk about in the next one too, because it's an interesting take. But um, no, I think that there's a huge there's a huge thing as far as like Fleur does deserve better. And I feel like this idea of um she like um I think like this idea of Molly not liking Fleur and the audience is supposed to understand that that's not okay gets lost again because there's no follow through. Like, I think that that's the biggest issue that I have with so many themes and plots in this in these books going forward is that there are brilliant groundwork laid tiles there and no follow through or no mm -hmm. satisfying follow through. Yeah, we will well, start to get frustrating about later books, which is why this book yeah. is the peak. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that like we have Fleur Delacour, who is awesome and brilliant and smart and all of these things, who is, who is you know valued for her beauty more than anything else. Even though, like, and, and but even though that like it villainizes her in the way that it's written, and mm -hmm. then we have this like correction of hey, Molly thinks that this is a terrible thing because she only wants Bill. And she's 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 dumb and stupid and just pretty. Um, and then there's like this moment of correction on there and no follow through, no change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are left with the same opinion of being like, okay, Molly still doesn't like her. Ginny still doesn't like her. Hermione still doesn't like her because she's pretty. Yeah. So I'm and sad to report. I'm sad to report. There's some Molly Weasley erasure going on here. I just searched AO3. There's plenty of Fleur slash Bill, of course. There's plenty of Fleur slash Hermione. I even found some Fleur slash Jenny. Not a single Fleur slash um, Molly fic. All of the Fleur and Molly fic um, are either them being antagonistic or platonic. Um, so someone has to fix this. Someone has guys, to fix this. I'll make you guys a deal. Uh, we'll come up with a goal. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a fundraiser or something. <laughs> I will write a Molly Fleur fiction. Uh, if you write it, you have to link it. You have to. If it's spicy, then link it in the I Discord. Won't... If it's not spicy, then um, you know. Oh, but we'll we're not, to... I'm not going to release it until we do whatever goal. Like, this okay, is gonna, we'll figure something out. Earned. We'll figure something out because this needs to be changed, but also earned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just can't believe this doesn't exist out of all the, you know, hundreds of thousands of Harry Potter fic on AO3. It doesn't this exist. My, this is my head canon. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a good one. I've never thought of it before. I've definitely seen right. Fleur Hermione before, just but not Fleur, but Fleur, not Fleur Molly. So yeah, Fleur deserved better. I think it's it's tragic. It's tragic how she's treated because um, she really is the most well-adjusted character in the entire series like she doesn't have trauma really she doesn't have baggage she she is like she is like her best version of herself at a very young age and everyone just shits on her because she's pretty yep sucks uh and we see this we see this throughout with most of the women um yeah in the series like Hermione gets shit on and she gets yep. shit on because of all of the other misogyny it's interesting. It's also interesting to take into consideration the amount of depth to the characters that JKR writes that are women versus male characters. Um, and the, the amount of male characters far outweighs the amount and depth of female characters. True. And this is obviously not just a JKR problem. This is a problem overall. Um, but it is very interesting 
yeah uh to see and to have especially because this story the story of harry potter in general is so gender neutral uh and harry and himself is such a gen- gender neutral character mm-hmm. that it's just a very it's it's just interesting to see yep welcome so much jar blinks i love your name and thank you so much for following i agree Hello. being pretty hurts being pretty hurts um and that's why gorgeous gorgeous girls stand up for other pretty people yeah so that's what we're doing here gorgeous, today gorgeous florida deserve better stand up for <laughs> other gorgeous gorgeous people mm-hmm. that's right um yeah thank you kitty <laughs> so i believe that brings us to the end yes i know we're over time but we are finally at the end guys so final <laughs> thoughts um so this book i think in a technical sense is the best of the harry potter series um the third book is my favorite but this book i think is the best one and it's one of the harry potter books that i can truly say is like um, really blows my mind like even rereading it i just still think this is an excellent book even though i have grown and matured as as a a reader and um, content consumer of all types of stories and so looking back on harry potter in a lot of ways i find a lot of flaws with it I, i i find a lot of things that can make me wonder like gosh, why was this so popular? There are so many better things. (laughs) But, you know, um, but not this book. This book is truly good. It's truly good, despite the fact that it has, um, we gave it such a long spot the problems section. Um, In a a technical sense, it it just, it pulls in JKR's um, best talents. And and I had an absolutely wonderful time rereading it. So those are my final thoughts. Um, so yeah, Landon, what are your final thoughts? I think it's also important just to just jump onto one of your points is that the, the, the spot, the problems aren't integral to the plot. Like they have been before. True. These are side thoughts. Don't like them. Um, they are still problems regardless of anything. Um, but they are side mm-hmm. plots mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's still problems, like I said, but as yep. far as, as far as this book and resonating, um, I'm in it. The, the journey with Harry Potter for me is that the first and second book are slogs. I hate them. Uh, the first one is better than the second one, but the second one is painful to reread, um, and is boring. The third one gets me excited again. It's one of my favorites. It's not my favorite, but it is one of my favorites. And the fourth one, it it keeps that stamina up and I forget about it every single time. I forget about how much I genuinely enjoy this book, that it is technically written the best, that it has so much depth and in the world, that it introduced so many themes and characters, that it really does feel like this, this climb map, like we're, we're climbing the final mountain now. All of the books before, we're getting to this place where we can actually climb Everest. And that's what it feels like we're doing. And I get excited about reading this book. And I will continue to be excited about reading the fifth one. And then we'll get to my favorite one, which is the sixth one. And then I'll be very disappointed about the seventh one. But (laughs) I don't hate the seventh one. It's just not that great. Um, But overall, it makes me so excited to continue reading. And this is the point where I start binging books. Um, like I said, it's a slog for the first two and then some of the third. And by the time I get to the fourth, I could finish the series in a week. If you gave me enough time, you just can tear through the rest. I could, I could tear through it. And it's not because they're easier reads. It's not because they're faster. Obviously they get bigger and bigger as we go. Um, but I'm in it, I'm sold and I'm invested. And I love that it makes me feel that way. Um, Mm -hmm. because sometimes when you get to a book series, you lose steam about halfway through and this series doesn't make me do that in fact it makes me do the opposite yeah there's so many series where like the first book blows your mind so much that none of the other sequels live up to it and you slowly lose interest now i do slowly lose interest with harry potter we'll talk about that more as we get to the next books but um but this one truly excellent still resonates with me um i still think the the themes are you know are very um are very impactful in the way that they're in the way that they're portrayed the way that that they're written i think that um that it does it clearly does everything it sets out to do masterfully it does it's yeah. fantastic 
Um, and I, I also think that a huge part of my like sprint to the end from this and like need to binge the rest of the series has to do with the fact that I, that we had to wait three years or four years for the next book after this one. Yeah. Uh, and that I sprinted to the end of this one. And then it was like, oh, now we have to wait. Yeah. Uh, so now that we have to wait, you all have to wait. <laughs> Unfortunately. So the, the plan is that we'll talk about the fifth book um, in March, but I'm a very slow reader, so that could easily get pushed back to April and we might put something else in March. But um, we'll keep you guys updated. Of course, you know, um, all of my people that are subscribers, I give you guys um, a schedule each month of what we plan to do. It doesn't always work out exactly like that, but I but I do that. And of course, um, people in, in the Discord in general, even if you're not subscribers, tend to know what's going on first. So if you're interested in that, that, join the discord that's where i keep people updated the most up-to-date is subscribers but um but regular people in the discord uh also tend to know things before like i post them on twitter or talk about them on stream or things of that nature so you can get into there um and so with that uh what are we gonna do next time landon uh next time we have a very special guest who is going sasha is going to join us she's a longtime friend yep. of can we go to the next slide Sorry, oh, one more sorry. slide. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, it, she's a longtime friend of the podcast and has come on to our podcast and has or stream and has um, talked about many heavy topics before, especially aunties and her experience with them. Uh, so next time we're going to talk about uh, how the attack and the movement to attack and dethrone women creatives and what yeah. that looks like and how that's kind of taken over media and other areas of the creative realms. Yeah. So something that we have noticed is that, man, if you're like a woman or if you're queer or if you're, especially if you're either of those things and also a person of color, man, nobody wants you to get popular and they will okay. destroy you the second that you do. Yeah. And, um, and it's usually by other women and queer people which is just like it just blows my mind that we don't want to lift each other up but we don't and so we're going to talk about a few examples of that that we have seen come up um in kind of the the twitter verse and uh, and some thoughts about why that might happen and um you know i like to be hopeful so you know maybe some things that we can individually do better so that we're not contributing to um to the brigading of uh, of creatives and and attempts to cancel uh, creatives, because it's true that the more marginalized you are, the harder you get you get it whenever it's time to cancel somebody. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about that. So that's next week. That's next week on Saturday in Interstage Window, as always, from noon to two Eastern time. And it'll be an interesting and really fun and educational experience and, and conversation. So please mm -hmm. come join us. Um, Sasha we, always cites her sources, so that this is going to be a good one. She, she's very logical. <laughs> um, but until then... Karen, where can they find you? All right, so you can also find me here on Thursdays. So in addition to the Interstage Window that you're watching right now, I also have a Thursday stream, Card Artistic License, which is more about um, just what I like to do. So right now we're mostly doing a leaf green Nuzlocke. I absolutely love Pokemon, but I've never done a Nuzlocke before, so that's what we're doing. Um, I've only killed one so far. We've done two episodes, and we're going to have our third episode next Thursday. And, uh, and so far only one friend has died, so I think that's doing pretty good, right? <laughs> Um, I also have a YouTube channel. You can find all of my VODs on my YouTube channel, as well as um, old con older content that I've done. Right now, I'm really just focusing on my streaming, so all the recent content is going to be VODs, but you'll find other stuff on there, too. Um, I also have Twitter. There's all my socials. I just linked them in the chat. You guys know how this works. And um, you can find out more detailed information about me and all of the creative projects that I do in my card, which is also linked in the chat. So that's where you guys can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Land in Maine. Um, that's a lot of fun. I do a lot of sometimes fun hot takes. <laughs> uh, and then you can also find me here every, mostly every Saturday, uh, chatting with Karen and talking about lives and things on media. Fun uh, stuff. Yeah. I am taking book recommendations right now. So if you want to hop over to our Discord and throw things into the chat there, I am more of a stalker than I am a participant. But uh, I am trying to read 100 books this year and need suggestions. I like uh, typically YA, fantasy, and speculative fiction. So, yep. Landon yeah. embodies the um, idea of lurk more, which I think everyone <laughs> should practice doing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yep. All right. So I'm doing in a funny comment. (laughs) (laughs) I love the pictures of your book journal, by the way. I'm so excited to see that more filled out. It's so fun and pretty. I love it. I love it. It's so aesthetic and beautiful. I've I've read many fan fictions this month so far. That counts. I love that you have fan fictions in there because I believe that 100% counts. I just read this last two weeks alone over COVID and this week, I read a 439,000 word fiction and a 178,000 word fan fiction. But that's a thousand thousand words and three or a thousand pages and 300 pages. Bite me, they count. Landon, you read so fast. I just can't. I, I just can't. I, I someday I would love to get my reading mojo back, but you know. But anyway, until then, I do audiobooks. All right, guys. All right. So we are going to raid into um, a moist goat stream today. That's our friend Moisty. Um, <laughs> that's who we're going to raid into. He doesn't stream super often, but he is streaming right now. So we're going to take advantage of that. He is part of um, Elixir, which is the Twitch networking server that I'm a part of, which I do recommend if you're a Twitch streamer to hop on in there and get to know those guys. They're they're really awesome. Um, so that being said, uh, I think that's all. So as always, of course, guys, make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. See you later.